What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If Hashirama Had Added Grandson With Wood Release, Part 3. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. In these four years, Araki and Kushina had grown a lot. Not just by their height or weight, but their growth and density of their chakra. Araki also felt that the power of his physique had improved with his age. He could heal quicker than before. And he realized he didn't even need to use hand seals to heal himself. Araki had learned the Senju clan taijutsu style, while Kushina had learned the Uzumaki clan's taijutsu style. Their elemental training had been going great. It took Araki these four years to completely master his water and earth elements, consequently making his wood style even stronger. These days, he had started to work on the wind affinity. He found that the wind was the best element to enhance his taijutsu style significantly. It added a sense of fluidity in his taijutsu style. And currently, he had only succeeded in the leaf-cutting exercise of the wind chakra. He had a long way to go before mastering it. Kushina had mastered her water affinity with the use of shadow clones. She also had pretty good control over her wind chakra. However, she did prefer to use water chakra more. Right now, Araki was seated in the Senju clan manor with a faint smile over his lips. He was reading a paper stating that some foreign shinobi had entered Kanoha as envoys to express their goodwill. Araki threw the paper with away while saying, looks like they have finally come. They came quite a bit later than expected. He then called out for 10 or so Uzumaki clan members and ordered them to disable all seals. The Uzumaki clan members were confused by this order. They wondered why their leader had given them such an order. There was a teenager of age 16 year old named Uzumaki Aisao. He had a confused look on his face as he asked Araki, Arakisama, are you sure it would be alright to disable all the seals around the manor? Wouldn't someone use this opportunity to enter the manor? To which, Araki shook his head and replied, nobody will know whether the seals around the manor have been disabled or not. I wonder if Danzo's men will dare to enter this manor after their unsuccessful attempts from before. Well, I certainly hope he does send them. He whispered the last line with a low voice, but Uzumaki Aisao still heard it. He shivered upon hearing that voice. He was well aware that Araki seemed to take immense pleasure in seeing these shinobi die. Besides, we will have some more guests in these days. I want to welcome them personally. The smile on his face made the Uzumaki members shiver uncontrollably. The last time, Araki had handled the situation. The shinobi had ended up with multiple stakes in his body before they were burned. It was like Araki was letting them experience how melted metal felt in their body. Moreover, the smile on Araki's face was widening upon seeing the shinobi squealing in pain. Uzumaki Aisao mentally decided to not be near Araki when he is handling the situation personally. In fact, many of the Uzumaki clan members decided the same. It was far too brutal for their tastes. With that, the Uzumaki clan disabled the seals. After Kushina returned from her training, she noticed that the seals around the Senju clan manor were disabled. Later in the evening, Kushina asked Araki, did you order the Uzumaki clan members to disable the seals? Why did you ask them? Araki informed her with an indifferent gaze, I am waiting for our guests. It would have been a pity if they couldn't even enter the manor. Our guests? Do you mean someone from Uchiha clan? Kushina asked him with a surprised look on her face. Araki though shook his head and responded, don't worry, you will know soon enough. They are quite near to the manor. Kushina showed off a puzzled look on her face. She used Kurama's negative emotions ability and sensed five unfamiliar chakra signatures of Shinobi. All these five seemed to have some kind of wicked thought in their heart. However, it seemed to be nothing compared to what she felt from Araki. She could feel his negative feelings were explicitly directed at these five Shinobi. They didn't need to wait for too long. It seemed that after ten or so minutes, these Shinobi entered the Senju clan's territory. 
All of them wore dark clothes along with a black mask which covered their face. One of them spoke, the rakage ordered us to kill that Senju clan descendant who killed a lot of our comrades four years ago. And also kidnapped that Uzumaki girl who was with him. It's reported that she has unique chains which restrain Abiju's chakra. Alright, what will be our formation? 221 sounds alright. Although these two may be kids, Rikage informed us that we must not underestimate them. One of them spoke with a grim look. They continued to remain outside the Senju clan manor and were running around it as if trying to find Araki and Kushina's position from the windows. They soon found Araki and Kushina in a room west of the Senju clan manor. All five immediately gathered after finding them. Araki and Kushina were seemingly sleeping from what they saw outside the window. However, just to be cautious, they threw a smoke bomb inside the room. The smoke released from these bombs caused even a Jounin ranked shinobi to faint. This should be enough. With that, they took some sort of pills which was an antidote for this smoke and two of these shinobi entered Araki's room. The first thing they did was stab Araki's stomach while he was sleeping. After that, another one picked up Kushina's body and left immediately. However, these two shinobi who had entered Araki's room were shocked to find that their comrades were missing. They noticed some leaves were falling and looked up. There they saw? Their comrades tied by thick vines and raised above the ground. The vines were tightening around their body. The two shinobi immediately moved and cut apart those vines with their swords and kunai enhanced by lightning and wind chakra respectively. Their three comrades gracefully landed on the ground. Let's leave. We have accomplished our objective. One of them spoke to his comrades. This place was far too strange. He had a bad feeling the longer he stayed here. Oi oi? Why are you returning so early? I have still not given you a warm welcome in the Senju clan manner. They heard an amused voice from above. They unconsciously raised their heads and noticed Senju Araki seated there with a cold yet humorous look in his eyes. The smoke inside Araki's room cleared away, and a piece of stabbed wood revealed itself in place of Araki. Unconsciously, they all gulped down a mouthful of saliva as they realized that they had jumped into a trap. The Kushina on the person's shoulder dispersed in a cloud of smoke. The rakage really likes to court death. He probably has some sort of fetish with it by now. Don't you agree? He gave them a pleasant smile which made them shiver unconsciously. The Kumo Shinobi looked around and noticed there was no one around. If it was a trap, there was a possibility that other Shinobi from Konoha could be on standby before they attack. Are you worried about someone attacking us? Don't be so worried. If I needed help to deal with you, then I would have wasted these four years. Araki said with a cold tone before jumping down on the ground. Oomph. If it's you alone, we can take care of you quickly. One of them seemed to have quite some nerves as he said it to Araki. Um, you have some spunk. I will leave you for the last, your friends come first. Araki said before staring at these ANBU members from Kumo. Araki stared at the Kumo shinobi and waited for them to make the first move. And they did. Two of them disappeared in a lightning flash and were quite close to Araki's body. Both of them had their own weapons in their hands, namely, a kunai and a sword. However, before they could touch Araki, two earth walls suddenly appeared in their way which blocked their attacks. At this time, two more Kumo Shinobi were attacked from a distance. They were using the respective Jutsu. Lightning Release, Multiple Lightning Arrow Jutsu. Water Release, Water Bubble Jutsu. Ten or so lightning arrows appeared in the air while a giant water bubble appeared as well. It seemed to cover all the lightning arrows. The lightning arrows had seemingly become even more powerful when charged with the impure water. After feeling that the charge was enough, the lightning arrows shot towards Araki with blinding speed. Araki didn't even blink when he was attacked by these lightning arrows. The lightning arrows struck him but didn't damage him. He wasn't even paralyzed. This surprised the shinobi from Kumo. Araki seemed to be in a good mood as he explained, I used earth chakra to guide the lightning in the ground. So, what will be next? At that moment, the fifth person whispered something in an inaudible voice. Suddenly, Araki felt his surroundings change a little. He saw a fearful snake appearing in front of himself while charging at him with a quick speed. The snake looked incredibly ferocious and would definitely swallow in one bite. This was the feeling it gave. Yet, Araki's expression never changed. He simply continued to walk forwards and the illusion around him shattered. 
The man who used the Jinjutsu backed away a little with a cautious look in his eyes. Araki spoke, that was a pitiful attempt. Your illusions really can't be compared to the illusions from a Sharingan. Now, I have been kind enough to let each one of you make the first move. The glint in his eyes changed. He had more of a feral look as he glanced at them all, let's get started, shall we? With that, he first decided to deal with the two Kumo Shinobi nearest to his position. The two Kumo Shinobi realized the danger and immediately backed away using Lightning Chakra. After boosting their speed with Lightning Chakra, they should have been fast enough to evade Araki. However, they were utterly dumbfounded when they noticed Araki closing the distance between them. He didn't even seem to be enhancing his body with any element. This meant it was his base speed. Just as Araki closed the distance between them, Araki suddenly stopped and punched the ground with a strong fist. The ground beneath him shattered into tiny pieces, and the two Kumo Shinobis running in front of Araki were revealed there. The two Kumo Shinobi who were still running suddenly dispersed with streaks of lightning. These two were Lightning Shadow Clone. The two Kumo Shinobi who had been hiding in the earth were forced out by Araki's punch on the ground. Just as they were about to attack Araki with their quickest attack, a tree branch pierced their stomach, and their bodies started rising in the sky. Naturally, the other three Kumo Shinobi didn't remain silent. One of these three was using his Jutsu to hit Araki while the other two were moving forwards to save their comrades from the branches of the tree. Earth Style, Earth Punch Jutsu. The earth near the Kumo Shinobi's feet crumbled before it turned into an Earth Punch. The Earth Punch launched itself towards Araki's position. A water wall appeared to block the Earth Punch. The eyes of the Kumo Shinobi widened because there was no water around them, and they hadn't even seen Araki performing any hand seals. Meanwhile, the two Kumo Shinobis who were jumping towards the tree which held their comrades captive suddenly noticed they had been attacked by some wooden spears. Noticing that twenty or so wooden spears were coming towards them, the two Kumo Shinobis tried to control their body in the air to some extent to dodge some of them. Well, they were successful in that regard. Only a hand or leg was pierced. The Kumo Shinobi managed to keep these wood spears from hitting any of their vital points. However, Araki smirked at this moment. He raised his hand towards these Kumo Shinobi who had been pierced by his wood spears. He suddenly clenched his fist and muttered, expand. The wood spears, which had pierced their arms or legs suddenly expanded. In just an instant, these small wood spears had become as large as trees. Naturally, the Kumo Shinobi lost their arms or legs in the process. The reason they could save their lives was that they decisively cut apart their arm and leg. With an arm and a leg missing respectively, they fell on the ground, bleeding heavily. Only a single one remained out of these five Kumo Shinobi, and he started running from the area. He didn't want to be caught or killed at this moment. He felt that saving his life would be the most effective. Fortunately for him, Araki didn't plan on pursuing him. The Kumo Shinobi continued to run for ten or so minutes. It was then, he met a red-headed girl on the way. He realized this girl was similar to the report of Kushina Uzumaki who had unique chains which restrained Abijia's chakra. However, he felt that he had seen her somewhere before. His memory wasn't that strong, but he did know that this girl had given him a strong impression the last time he saw her. Kushina hatefully stared at this person in front of her while muttering, You wanted to kill Araki. You really wanted to kill Araki. The Kumo Shinobi thought about some seconds and decided to run away. He felt that Araki could appear at any time. So, it would be better to run away. However, how could Kushina let him go so easily? She moved later than him but had quickly closed the distance between them. Just as the Kumo Shinobi was about to counter Kushina by stabbing her with a kunai, Kushina punched his gut solidly. The Kumo Shinobi couldn't help but hold his stomach and back away while coughing out blood. Kushina didn't feel any pity for him. She moved forwards and kicked his face so strongly that it detached from the rest of his body. The head splattered upon hitting a tree while the rest of the body fell upon the ground. Meanwhile, Araki had tied the four Kumo Shinobi who had fought against him. He had a dark grin on his face as he stared at these four. Now, I wonder, which one among you will have the loveliest screams? The smile on his face was somewhat contrary to his actions. Out of these four, one of them spoke, we won't tell you anything no matter how much you torture us. Araki stared at them for some time before laughing out loud. His laugh confused them. 
wasn't this what he was planning? You think I am going to torture you to extract something as worthless as information? Don't overestimate yourself. Do you think you know something while I don't? I already know this was a tactic from the rakage. Next, the rakage is probably going to accuse me of attacking the Kumo envoys, right? These words terrified the four Kumo shinobi so much that they started to sweat immediately. I don't need to torture you to extract information. I am going to torture you because I find your screams pleasurable to hear. Now, let's get started, you will be the first one. He pointed towards the guy who had his arm cut off. With this, the suffering of Kumo Shinobi had started in Araki's hands. After he was satisfied with Kumo Shinobi's performance, Araki killed them all. He then started sleeping with a peaceful expression on his face. Kushina entered his room and noticed the peaceful smile on his face. She touches his hairs and gently pats him before laying next to him. She closed her eyes and started sleeping soon enough. They woke up in the morning. After the morning exercise, they returned to their house. Around this time, Araki received a summon from the Hokage, stating that he must immediately come to the Hokage's office. Araki knew what it was about, but Kushina had little idea about it. Reassuring her with a smile, he left the Senju clan manor. Meanwhile, Kushina ordered all the Uzumaki clan members inside the manor to reactivate the seals. The Uzumaki clan members immediately obeyed her order. They were seemingly waiting for this order and immediately went to reactivate the seals. On the other hand, Araki had reached the Hokage's office. The secretary glanced at him before giving him a short bow. He entered the office with an indifferent expression on his face. There, his eyes fell upon the third Hokage, and two dark-skinned men standing in front of the Hokage. Just from their skin complexion and what had happened the previous night, he could guess that these two were from Kumo. So, why have I been called, Hokage-sama? He said, Hokage-sama, with a mocking tone. The third Hokage noticed it, but the two shinobi from Kumo didn't. They stared at him for some time before turning towards the third Hokage, Hokage-sama, I believe we asked you to call for the Senju clan head. Why has this child come instead of the Senju clan head? The third Hokage retained a serious look on his face and said, he is the Senju clan head. Whatever you want to talk, talk with him. The Hokage seemed to want to wash his hands off this matter. Araki didn't care much about it. He also wanted to have a pleasant conversation with these two. The Kumo Shinobi went to call out for you yesterday night. Do you know where they are? The two Kumo Shinobi asked Araki with a stern look on their faces. Araki adopted a thoughtful look and then asked, Are you talking about the five Kumo Shinobi appearing the in middle of the night wearing dark clothes? The two Kumo Shinobi nodded their heads. Although they knew that the mission must have failed, they knew the rakage wouldn't forgive them if they returned without those five. Those five? Do you want their heads or bodies? Araki asked them with a smile on his face. But this question didn't please the Kumo envoys. They stared at Araki and spoke, What do you mean? They raised their tones in frustration. Araki indifferently stated, Can't you understand my words? I said those five are dead. To be honest, I don't even have their heads or body. After torturing them to my complete satisfaction, I fed their bodies to the Inazuka clan's dogs. The dogs were thrilled with the meal. Ask Rakage to send a few more. Maybe send ten or so every week. That should be enough food for the dogs for a week. The more Araki spoke, the angrier the Kumo envoys became. It was as if Araki was comparing them to a dog's food. Just how could that be tolerated? They angrily turned towards the Hokage and said, Third Hokage, is this your sincerity and peace between our villages? If you do not give us an explanation, Rakage sama wouldn't be pleased with it. The third Hokage let out a bitter laugh. This was far beyond his hands right now. He realized that the peace negotiations had fallen off now. On the one hand, he couldn't touch Senju Araki because of his status, while on the other hand, he didn't want to anger the third Rakage too much. He knew that in these five years, the three villages had been heavily supported by their respective nation's daimyo. Not just the money, the daimyo had even provided the three great villages with resources to turn more of people into shinobi. Although the third Hokage had been aware of it, he decided not to take any action because he thought that the destruction of their army at Yuzushio's hand would be enough to contain them. However, today's Kumo's envoys made him understand that Kumo was still not satisfied. 
The purpose of sending these peace negotiations wasn't to build better relations, it was to extort Kanoha into accepting their demands. Or else, Rakage would probably ally with Kanoha's bitter enemy, IWA, and start a war. Understanding what was going to happen, the third Hokage internally decided to delay the war by compensating a little and enforce Kanoha's military. As long as they recruit more shinobi for the next four to five years, they could have enough strength to counter an attack from Kumo and IWA. Yet, the third Hokage was utterly unaware that Araki didn't plan on compensating a tiny bit. Araki was staring at the two Kumo envoys and said, Peace? How interesting, so, you mean to say that if I don't provide a reasonable explanation or compensation for those five Kumo shinobi, Kumo will declare war upon Kanoha. That's right. One of these two even agreed immediately. Then you can return now. Araki seemed to have given his order to these Kumo shinobi. Huh? What do you mean? The Kumo envoys were confused by Araki's words. Just what did he mean by that? Weren't they going to get some compensation? Your compensation can be your ability to walk out of Kanoha? Is that enough, I wonder? Araki gave them a cheerful smile as if he had given them a good offer. W what are you talking about? Didn't I mention it to you that your five comrades were eaten by dogs from Inazuka clan? Actually, some dogs are still hungry. I am almost tempted to kill you and feed your bodies to the dogs. I am sure they wouldn't deny a meal from Kumo. The cheerful smile on Araki's face, plus the ruthless look in his eyes made them believe that this was entirely possible. At this moment, the Hokage spoke to not let the matters get worse, send you Araki, you should know that your words are incredibly important. Tens of thousands of Kanoha's shinobi may die due to the consequences of your words. Oh, really? So, does that mean we must lower our head for something as worthless as peace when even these dogs can come and threaten Kanoha? Araki asked the Hokage with a casual look on his face. Who are you calling dogs? Sorry my bad. I made a mistake. Dogs must not be insulted by comparing them to you. They are quite lovely animals. Your status isn't any higher than a dog's food. Araki didn't even glance at the Kumo envoys at this point. He felt that they weren't even worth gazing at. In fact, he continued to look at the Hokage, who narrowed his eyes. You have heard his response. You can leave now. The Hokage seems to want to dismiss these Kumo envoys. These two Kumo envoys were extremely angry that the Hokage wasn't going to take a decision in their favor. The fact that they hadn't been compensated for such humiliation didn't help the situation. However, they had little choice now and left the office. Araki continued to stare at the Hokage for some time before he asked, the way you are trying to use me. It's quite funny, monkey. What do you mean? The Hokage just stared at him blankly. You knew I wouldn't compensate them. You are using me as a shield to reject the Rakage envoys. That is the whole reason you let those Kumo envoys leave, you want them to inform the Rakage that it was me, the Senju clan head, Senju Araki, who didn't want to give any compensation to Kumo. Now, even if Rakage wants to find fault in someone, he can only do it against me. Saving Kanoha while sacrificing the Senju. Araki had a mocking smile on his face while he stared at the third Hokage. The third Hokage visibly flinched upon those words, but he didn't deny them. Kanoha is so pathetic that it can't even take stand for its founding clans. The Uzumaki clan has already been destroyed, you are already targeting the Senju clan. I wonder if the Uchiha clan is next. Araki asked the Hokage with a smile which sent shivers down the Hokage's smile. You are just overthinking about the situation. Why would I take any action against the founding clans of the village? The Hokage tried to say it with an indifferent voice, but his heart was trembling with frustration. This wasn't what he planned? Araki was pretty amused by the Hokage's reactions and turned around, well, not as it matters. You will feel the consequences of your actions later, monkey. After saying that, he left the Hokage's office. Not just the power of Hashirama-sama. He also possesses the cunningness of Toburama-sama. However, he doesn't possess either one's loyalty. The Hokage thought in his head. It had been some time since Araki had left the Hokage's office. While the Hokage was managing his paperwork, Jiraiya, the Toad Sage entered the Hokage's office with his blonde-haired disciple following him. As far as the Hokage remembered, this boy's name was Namikaze Minato. 
He had been the one to graduate from the academy with a full score at the age of 10. He had been assigned to a Genin team, and after two years, he had already become a Chunin. Sensei, how long do I have to remain in the village? I want to take my disciple outside the village. Jiraiya was pretty much asking a mission for his disciple. Not now. You can't leave the village these days. At least not for another quarter of the year. The third Hokage said with a solemn voice. Oi Sensei? For months? Are you kidding me? I can't remain in the village for so long. What about my research for my next novel? Jiraiya asked while raising his brows and asking the third Hokage. He knew that the Hokage would usually agree when he brings up this point. This time, the third Hokage didn't back down. Instead, he had a very resolute look in his eyes as he said to Jiraiya, remain in the village. I need your power and prestige here. And if you are worried about your apprentice not getting any experience here, I can assign him a mission with his genin team. You cannot leave the village, though. Minato knew that some important talk was going to happen between his sensei and the third Hokage. He tactfully left the office before being ordered by Jiraiya. Hiruzen was quite fond of this boy. He was powerful for his age, smart, humble, and tactful. This boy had quite good relations with the inheritors of almost all the clans in the village. Well, except for the Senju clan, Achiha clan, and the Hyuga clan. Alright, tell me what's the matter. What has happened that you need my presence here? Jiraiya asked in an uncharacteristically serious voice. I need to choose my words wisely. The Hokage reminded himself before narrating the whole scene to Jiraiya. Jiraiya frowned a little as he heard the story. He had heard of Senju Araki from the mouth of Hataki Sakuma when they last met. Other than complaining a little about Senju Araki's antics of taking Kakashi out to play, the man was full of praise about Senju Araki. It wasn't rare for him to hear Hataki Sakumo praising someone. But his last wording surprised him. It won't take him long to surpass us if we continue to slack off. This wording was indeed surprising to hear from the mouth of the White Fang. Jiraiya hadn't taken Hataki Sakumo's words that seriously. He thought that Sakumo was probably just overestimating his apprentice. However, from what he had heard of his sensei's mouth just now, he realized that Sakumo's words weren't exaggerated. All right, tell me, what do you want me to do? Use your spy network to its full potential to find out any possible movements between Kumo and IWA. Make sure to find out if they have any plans of allying or not. Remain ready to do a mission. From the Hokage's tone, Jiraiya got the feeling that it wouldn't be anything less than an S-rank mission. Got it. I will get to work then. Jiraiya mentally decided to train as well. It seems that another great war was around the corner. Just before he was about to leave, the Hokage said to Jiraiya, Also, let your apprentice interact with the Uchiha. You should know what I mean. A serious look appeared on Jiraiya's face as he asked, Wouldn't that be dangerous? The situation is different now. After hearing his sensei's words, Jiraiya returned to his place to begin preparations. In another location, while Araki was returning to his manor. He was attacked on the way. The ones who attacked him were twenty or so dark clothed men. Araki didn't even need to think about who they were. Definitely the courtesy of Danzo. He thought in his head, that man is really persistent. It seems that Danzo believed this was the best time to kidnap Araki. The effect of that threat seems to have vanished by now. Well, I was already quite grieved when I let those Kumo Shinobi leave. I guess you will also do just fine. Araki said with a smile on his face. He didn't plan on playing with them at all. The twenty or so shinobi stood on top of trees and pulled out shuriken with some strings. Do you think I didn't know you were following me? I have known this since leaving the Hokage's office. The reason you have caught up with me isn't because of your ability, it's because I wanted you to. As for why? Araki gave them a smile before shouting, would release, would sphere jutsu. A wooden sphere completely covered Araki's body, and the twenty root A and B U were confused as to why he would do that. Explode! Boundless chakra seemed to have been injected in the trees within one mile of Araki. Before the ANBU shinobi understood what has happened, the entire area exploded loudly. It was so loud that it caught half of Kanoha's attention, including the Hokage, Danzo, Jiraiya, Orochimaru, and Sakumo Hataki. They had a familiar expression on their faces. Each one held a frown on their face. 
To them, it felt like this was an attack from an enemy. Well, only Danzo seemed to have the hint of the true reason behind this explosion. This was a reply from Senju Araki. This could mean a lot of things, but Danzo had a faint idea that this was an action from Senju Araki stating that he was getting fed up with Danzo's little attacks. Meanwhile, the Hokage and Jiraiya immediately decided to rush at the area. They wanted to gauge the situation firsthand. The ANBU wouldn't be appropriate for this task. As the Hokage and Jiraiya reached the location where the explosion occurred, they saw an entire area scorched in black color. However, there seemed to be a thick wooden sphere in the middle of this area. The Hokage and Jiraiya didn't need to think that much to know whose it was. Araki soon opened up the wood sphere and appeared in their vision. He looked at the forest around him and clicked his tongue in disappointment, I guess I should compensate for destroying such a beautiful place. Wood style, deep forest emergence. He shouted the name of the technique. But unlike how he had used it against the three great village, this time, hundreds of trees started to grow in the radius in which he had detonated all trees. The distance between the trees was fixed, so there would be no issue of nutrients even after he left them alone. The Hokage and Jiraiya remained hidden as they peeked at Araki. This was outside the Hokage's expectation that Araki could already use this jutsu with his own chakra. From the reports of the spies, Araki could only use this jutsu against the three great villages through the Kyuubi's chakra. This was beyond the Hokage's or Jiraiya's expectations that Araki would be able to do this. Moreover, after restored the detonated area to some extent, Araki turned towards the direction of the Hokage and Jiraiya, he gave them a smile. A mocking smile they understood was directed at them. The Hokage knew that Araki wanted to say that their pitiful concealment couldn't prevent them from his senses. He felt like his heart was burning with anger upon seeing that condescending gaze. Araki though didn't come to say anything to the Hokage, he merely turned his body and proceeded to move towards the Senju clan manor. Kushina was waiting for him back there. After Araki had left the area, Jiraiya looked at the third Hokage before saying with a serious gaze, just who had attacked Araki here in Kanoha? Has someone from the other great villages entered Kanoha right under our nose? The third Hokage groaned a little as he didn't know how he should explain this to Jiraiya. He knew that if he mentioned it to Jiraiya, Jiraiya would force him to take an extreme measure. Even though this Danzo's root ANBU was quite a pesky in some matters, they had their uses as well. There were many things which he couldn't do as Hokage and could be left in Danzo's hands. Even if someone did find the blame, they could only blame Danzo and his root ANBU. However, he was also aware of the character of Jiraiya. His information gathering skills were top notch. If he really wanted to figure out who was behind this attack on Araki, he wouldn't need a long time. At most, a few days. Weighing both sides for some time, the third Hokage answered Jiraiya, the ones who attacked him were probably Danzo's root ANBU. If my guess is right, Danzo wanted to capture Senju Araki to control Uzumaki Kushina, the Kyuubi's Jinchuriki. And since Sensei does know of this, why have you not acted yet? Why has the Danzo not been warned? Jiraiya asked while narrowing his eyes. He knew there were some things the third Hokage was hiding from him. There has never been any public attack on Senju Araki. This was the first time Danzo had initiated a public attack. I wouldn't take any action against Danzo as long as his actions were within reason. The third Hokage easily gave out an excuse. Snorting at the answer he received, Jiraiya said, I will be the judge of that whether this was the first time Danzo attacked Senju Araki publicly or not. However, do tell me what action you plan on taking against Danzo now. The third Hokage remained silent before decisively saying, I will disband the root ANBU. That should be enough. Humph. I see the situation now. I also understand why you want Minato to interact with Uchiha. You want to sow discord between the Senju and Uchiha, don't you? Well, Sensei, looks like I am not going to follow this order. My apprentice can love anyone he wants. I am not going to ask him to follow her just to follow your sick little schemes. Find someone else to do your dirty work. With that, Jiraiya left the area, leaving an extremely angry Hokage behind. This was what the Hokage was scared of the most. Jiraiya had nearly seen through a lot of his schemes. As long as he was given enough time, he would see through all of them. The Senju clan's prestige was so great that even as a Hokage, he couldn't touch them. And just because of that high prestige, 
The Achiha's reputation which had been degraded through the combined efforts of Senju Tobarama and Sarutobi Hiruzen had started recovering. It felt like Senju Araki was becoming a significant obstacle in many of his schemes. Meanwhile, in another part of the village, Danzo was changing his hideouts immediately. He had a feeling that if given some time, Senju Araki would come here to kill them all. Although Danzo was confident in taking on Senju Araki one-on-one, -on -one, he knew that he couldn't prevent Senju Araki from killing a large number of his subordinates. It had taken a long time until he could seize this much power from that fool of Hokage. He wasn't willing to work from the bottom again. That was why he had taken the decision to change all his hideouts. This time, he was going to create a hideout under the ground. It should be safe from Senju Araki's senses? In another corner of the village, a pale man with slitted pupils and golden eyes smiled, looks like his power has reached the appropriate level. Anymore, and it could be dangerous to me. This man was naturally, Orochimaru, one of the three Sanin. He started thinking, after I acquire Araki's body, I could inject Senju Hashirama's cells which I received from that black thing into Araki's body, boosting its prowess even further. Maybe then it would transcend the limit of mortals. He then started thinking of his living corpse reincarnation technique. He had created that technique with the help of Danzo and that black thing named Black Zetsu. Danzo provided him with prisoners while Black Zetsu provided him with some of his own insights. Araki had no idea that his current actions had caught the interest of the snake Sanin. Well, even if he knew, he would probably remain indifferent to it. Orochimaru may be above Araki in terms of raw power at this moment, but Araki still had some hidden cards under his sleeve. And, Hataki Sakumo let out a sigh after that explosion. This was a signal from Araki to him. In these years, he had asked Araki to not make his move against Konoha as long as he wanted to be his apprentice. He couldn't really do anything about the root ANBU going to Senju Clan Manor just to die. But, he could prevent Araki from personally getting rid. But, this seems to have come to an end. This explosion meant that Araki believed he was strong enough to take on anyone in the village. That he would retaliate immediately if someone goes against him. And he had an idea of who Araki's first target will be. Shimura Danzo, he was an ambitious man but a coward deep inside his heart. Currently, he was changing his hideouts to prevent his men from being killed by a threat he had recently provoked. The shinobi who were changing their hideouts were his own personal force. Not even the Hokage was aware of these shinobi. Some of them had been kidnapped from some of the reputed clans of Konoha. Many of them, though came from Konoha's orphanages. Only after tens of years of training could they finally stand on the threshold where Danzo could assign them crucial missions. However, he found that half of these shinobi had gone missing. He had received a report of the shinobi who had successfully reached their new hideouts. However, he was surprised when the number was nearly half of the total number of shinobi under him before. Just what had happened? Where could they disappear to? Yet, he received no answer, which even made his heart start to tremble. He felt as if he was being targeted by someone. However, that person felt that it wasn't yet time to utterly destroy him. To think he was living on someone's sympathy? This was an insult Danzo couldn't tolerate. Moreover, in the Senju clan manor, Araki stared at the hundreds of Uzumaki clan members with an indifferent gaze, were you successful in capturing them? Yes, Araki-sama. We captured nearly half of Danzo's whole force. It was all thanks to your sensing skill that you knew where their new hideouts were going to be, and we could lay a trap in advance. Uzumaki Aisao said with a respectful gaze while staring at Araki. It was ultimately done by you. You all deserve praise for accomplishing this matter. Araki gave them a smile while praising them. Uzumaki Aisao didn't dwell on it for too long before asking Araki, what will we do with these captured men? I will be killing one every day and sending his head to our good old Danzo. Let's see how long it takes until he angers himself to death. Araki said with a casual smile on his face. That? Wouldn't that be inappropriate if Danzo takes those heads to Hokage? Someone from Uzumaki clan asked Araki. He knew that their leader was strong, but it wasn't wise to make an enemy out of the Hokage yet. This is Danzo's personal force. To Konoha, these men do not exist in their records. Danzo would first need to mention that he tampered with the records. The third Hokage would first deal with Danzo before taking his anger out on me. Well, what can he do to me anyway? 
I can always say that I didn't know these are Konoha Shinobi, I never saw any record stating they are. At that time, even if the Hokage is so angry that he could be used to grill food, he would still swallow his anger and return to that office. He is a wise man, after all. Araki showed a cunning smile while explaining his reasoning. The Uzumaki clan members who saw his smile couldn't help but shake their heads. It seemed their leader was enjoying this far too much. All right, the meeting is adjourned now. Leave now. He hastily said while telling the Uzumaki clan members to leave the hall. He asked them to leave because Kushina was entering the hall. It didn't take the Uzumaki clan members to leave the hall. Kushina had a frown on her face as she entered the hall. She noticed that Araki was seated at the clan head's place. It seemed like he just had a meeting with other Uzumaki clan members. Araki. Someone is approaching the Senju clan manor. Kushina said with a grave look in her eyes. Yeah, I know. I sensed him earlier as well. If my guess is right, he is probably Orochimaru. I know the feel of Jiraiya, Monkey, Sensei, and Danzo. Since it's not one of these four, only Orochimaru remains with this power level. Araki casually stated his reasoning. What should we do? Although the seals around the clan manor are powerful, I doubt they can restrain a Sanin. Should we strengthen the seals around the manor? Kushina asked him with a puzzled expression. Araki gave her a comforting smile before standing up, he says while walking towards her, it would be an excellent opportunity to meet the Sanin. Let's find out what he wants. What if he hurts Dash, her questions were put to rest when she felt Araki's strong yet comforting arms around her thin body. Sure. He slowly whispered in her ears, at this time, he can't hurt me. Besides, I have you beside me. If he can still hurt me, I would just admit defeat. I? Kushina swallowed the words what she was about to say. Just melting in his embrace. She found it far too comfortable and relaxing to think of anything else. After he had calmed down Kushina's anxious heart, he gently holds her hand and giving her a smile before saying, his appearance might not necessarily be bad for us. What do you mean? Kushina gave him a puzzled look as she didn't understand how Orochimaru's appearance might be good for them. He was probably the one who sold the way to Yuzushio to the three great villages. It would be a good opportunity to get some revenge. Araki said with a hint of anger in his voice, but mostly, he concealed it by speaking in an amused tone. Do I wake up that fox? We may need its help, I mean. Kushina asked Araki who simply shook his head before replying to her, No, we can't rely on Kurama's chakra. It's a great boost, but at the end of the day, it's not our own power. Besides, you should be prepared for the time when Kurama will be extracted from your body and set to roam free in the world. Alright, I understand. Kushina gave him a nod. It's a good thing that Grandma set such a loose seal. You wouldn't be too hurt while releasing the Kurama from your body. Araki gave her a smile. His grip over her tightened. They both decided to go outside the manor. It wouldn't be a good idea to let Orochimaru break the many seals placed around the manor. It took quite some time to set them up. After waiting for half an hour, they finally saw the visage of the white snake. This was Orochimaru, the smartest disciple of the third Hokage. Upon noticing that Araki and Kushina were standing outside the mansion, Orochimaru gave them a smile. This made his objective easier. As he looked at Orochimaru, Araki greeted him with a smile, Hello, Orochimaru. This has been our first meeting, right? Greetings, Senju Araki. And yes, this is our first meeting. Both gauged each other for a few seconds. Araki stepped forward in front of Kushina, he asked Orochimaru with an emotionless voice, I have always been curious to know why the snake Sanin would sell the pathway to Yuzushio to the three great villages. So, why did you do it? Orochimaru's eyes narrowed a little upon hearing this question from Araki. He let out a laugh before answering, I am a shinobi. Obeying the order of my superior is natural. If it was Jiraiya who said that, I might have believed him. But since it's you, I am sure you have your own reasons. You wouldn't obey an order which wouldn't be beneficial for you. So, why did you obey this order from the Hokage or from Danzo? Araki asked with a sharp tone. I had no reason to deny his order. It wasn't related to me. I want to become Hokage to realize my ambition, so I need to make sure that Sensei continues to favor me over anyone else. 
Besides, it was a good opportunity to gather Uzumaki cells and conduct tests on them. As Orochimaru said this, Araki couldn't help but clench his fists. He understood now? Orochimaru also wanted to know the secrets in Uzumaki clan's blood. He was experimenting on Uncle Hishin, his own teacher Uzumaki Takuya, and other Uzumaki cells. Well, I can't hide my disappointment since the number of bodies was far lower than what I expected. There should be more according to my calculations, and I started to wonder where they were. And then, in a matter of few months, Senju clan received 200 or so members. A clan named Samazaki also appeared in the Land of Waves. Although there were only 100 people when they initially arrived, I merely thought of them as refugees from Kiri. But just after one year, the Samazaki clan has nearly 1,800 or so members. Isn't it a little suspicious? Orochimaru continued to speak to Araki with a smile on his face. Araki's eyes narrowed at that moment, he knew this snake has figured out the truth. Now. The question remained. Why did this snake not mention it to the Hokage or anyone else? Why have you kept it hidden till now? Why do you think so? I am not like my sensei. My sensei is far too loyal to Konoha and overthinks about it that he doesn't care about consequences which would be harmful to himself. But I, I love my life. I know that making you an enemy was a massive mistake on my part. I shouldn't have become your enemy by selling the Yuzushio's pathway to Kumo. However, since I have already done that, I needed something to offset that. By keeping my mouth quiet, I have saved the lives of the Uzumaki clan for such a long time. I am sure you won't forget this favor. Orochimaru had a smile on his face while staring at Araki. In turn, Araki sharply responded, You were the reason why Yuzushio's destruction happened. You were the reason why 1000s of Uzumaki clan members died. You think you can just wash off your crimes by this? Don't kid yourself. You can hardly expect any mercy from me. Orochimaru seemed to have thought about this point already, I already know that. But, even if it wasn't me who sold that information, Sensei or Danzo could have sent someone else. Why shouldn't I take advantage of the situation when it's favorable to me? Orochimaru, do you think of me as a fool? You think understanding your situation will let me forgive you? In fact, I want to kill you even more now. I agree that if it wasn't you, the third Hokage or Danzo could have sent someone else, but do not forget that you received favor because of these actions. Since you have received the favor, you will naturally need to bear the consequences of those actions as well. Araki said with a straightforward tone. Kushina was getting ready to attack Orochimaru. From Araki's words, she felt that they would soon fight the snake Sanin. However, Araki's hold over her hand tightened as if telling her now was not the time. Your age is quite deceptive. Even though you are just a brat, you do not have the naiveness of one. Orochimaru couldn't help but compliment Araki at this point. Araki shrugged off his praise. Being praised by a snake didn't excite him. He said, the most I will give you are six years. Make sure to do all you can in these six years. Whether it's building a powerful force, a village, or just hide. Once these six years are over, I will start my search for you. And when I do find you, pray to whatever you believe in that you receive a quick death. Araki said with an impassive voice. Orochimaru had a bitter smile on his face, you really don't plan on letting me off, right? These six years, you want to increase your strength even more just so that you are strong enough to completely suppress me because you aren't confident in taking me on at this moment. Araki though shook his head negatively. This wasn't the reason why he was letting Orochimaru live for these six years. Very well, I do accept this proposal. Orochimaru had little choice but to agree to this. He then said, there is something I have to tell you, though. I am sure you would find the information quite interesting. Araki raised his eyebrow as he wondered just what this snake was up to now. It's related to Zetsu. I wonder if you know anything about it. Orochimaru said this as a test. He was gauging Araki's reaction with complete concentration, and he wasn't disappointed when Araki showed a startled look. This kid was aware of quite a lot of secrets. Come closer if you want to hear this information. Araki thought for some moments before nodding. He whispered in Kushina's ear and told her to remain on the standby. After Araki was in a particular range, Orochimaru widely smiled before speaking, Living Corpse Reanimation Jutsu. Araki was surprised when Orochimaru attacked so suddenly and couldn't even put up a defense. Soon enough, 
He found himself in an unfamiliar location. There, he saw a massive white snake in this unfamiliar location. Welcome to this mindscape, Senju Araki. Your body is now mine. After saying that, Orochimaru launched his body at Senju Araki. You gauged my power according to what I revealed during the tournaments against the Uchiha. Looks like that idea worked out as well. And, you even think you are invincible in your own mindscape? How arrogant. Araki opened his mouth and said with a neutral voice. Orochimaru was somewhat puzzled when he said that. Do you know, I can even suppress Kushina and Kyuubi's chakra inside Kushina's mindscape. You think your chakra is stronger than theirs? Let me show you the difference between us. Orochimaru. An explosive amount of chakra was released from Araki's body. His vast amount of chakra flooded Orochimaru's entire mindscape. It was so great that just from the release of his chakra, Orochimaru felt his mindscape tremble. This. This wasn't in his plans. You. You can suppress me in my own mindscape? You have merely overestimated yourself, Orochimaru. You thought I couldn't do such a simple thing as suppressing you? My chakra is much more potent than you can imagine. Just before breaking apart this mindscape, Araki restrained his chakra. This place is actually convenient to talk. I don't need to be worried about that black Zetsu spying on us here. So, Orochimaru, why don't you start talking now? About Zetsu, I mean. A condescending smirk appeared on Araki's face as he casually sat on the ground of the mindscape while staring at the ugly snake-looking Orochimaru. What makes you think I will talk here? Orochimaru asks with a cautious look in his eyes. You should know as well as I do what will happen if I break your mindscape right now. You wouldn't even have the strength to truss up a chicken after that point. Wouldn't that be better for you? You can easily kill me. Orochimaru says while moving that white snake body of his own and coming closer to Araki. You are going to be convenient to be around. Though, instead of six years, you only have five years now. It's a good thing you chose to attack me, because if you had chosen Kushina, and even if she had not been in any danger due to Kyuubi's presence, I would have cut apart your legs and feed it to you before doing the same with your hands and the rest of your body. Araki had spoken these words while releasing his full killing intent. Orochimaru mentally praised himself for choosing Araki. Well, it was natural for him to choose Araki. He was the inheritor of Senju Hashirama's legendary Mokutan. Moreover, inside Kushina's mindscape was sealed Kyuubi. He was well aware that he couldn't take on that existence even if he was twice more powerful. Senju Araki was the better alternative out of the two. Now, make yourself useful, Orochimaru. Or are you really testing my patience? I find it incredibly hard to control my rage on the fact that you have experimented with Uncle Hishin and other Uzumaki clan members' bodies. Araki said with a deathly calm face. And sure enough, Orochimaru started talking. At this time, even Orochimaru didn't dare to speak any lies. He was aware that this would simply reduce his life even more. Araki continued to stare at him with an emotionless gaze. However, that wasn't his real mental state. In reality, he was startled when he heard from Orochimaru that he received Senju Hashirama's cells from that thing named Black Zetsu. And, if Black Zetsu had Senju Hashirama's cells, that meant Uchiha Madara possessed them. He thought in his head, how did Uchiha Madara acquire Grandpa's cells? Was it during their final battle? Or did someone dug up his corpse after his death? His eyes emitted a sharp light before he questioned Orochimaru, did you never ask that thing about how he obtained my grandfather's cells? Orochimaru shrugged in response, he did ask this, but that thing didn't answer him. However, he did have his own conjectures over what could have happened, it's possible that Black Zetsu was present during the final battle of Senju Hashirama. He may have gathered the blood and cells during that fight, or maybe he got them at some other time when Senju Hashirama lived. Or, he dug up the Senju Hashirama's body from the Senju ancestral grounds after he died. With his stealth, it is an impost dash, just as he said that he felt a tremendous pressure over his body. Araki was really incensed when he heard that last possibility. To think that Black Zetsu had dug up his grandfather's body. He unconsciously clenched his fists tightly. However, this wasn't all that Araki understood from his conversation with Orochimaru. It seems that Orochimaru was still unaware that Uchiha Madara still lived. Unlike how Uchiha Madara had asked Araki to meet him, he hadn't done the same with Orochimaru. 
This meant that he only met Araki because he had inherited Senju Hashirama's would release. Suddenly, his eyes widened as he remembered one startling fact. Achiha Madara couldn't use would release while he lived. No records state that. And when I met Achiha Madara, he could create a wood clone. Did, did that bastard injected grandpa's cells into himself to acquire the wood release? He was so angered that he unconsciously released so much chakra that would started to create in his surroundings. Orochimaru felt as if the control over his own mindscape was slipping. Some cracks were creating in his mindscape, and he was helpless while staring at Senju Araki. He knew that this boy was totally enraged and thought that maybe he shouldn't have stated the last possibility. At least he wouldn't be overly injured if he hadn't said that. Unfortunately, there was no medicine of regret. Yet, somehow he didn't know what happened, but Araki had calmed down. He turned to face Orochimaru and said. Hand over my grandfather's cells in your hands. If you refuse, I don't mind breaking that insignificant promise from before. Those cold eyes and that strange killing intent seemed to be overpowering his own. Orochimaru had no doubt in his mind that Senju Araki would kill him if he went against that order. Although he wanted to experiment more on those cells, he was well aware that he would simply be courting death. His life was more precious than his research. With this thought in his head, he readily agreed to Araki's demand. However, after agreeing with Araki's demand, he said, when should I hand over Senju Hashirama's cells to you? I mean, Black Zetsu knows precisely how many cells I have. Wouldn't I grab his suspicion if I hand them to you? This was an intelligent question. As expected of Orochimaru? Araki thought for some moments before saying, send a clone with my grandfather's cells. I don't believe that Black Zetsu can create clones and keep an eye on both of us. And even if he knows, let's see if he tries anything. At the end of his statement, Araki coldly sneered while daring the Black Zetsu to try anything. Unlike four years ago, Araki felt that he was ready to handle Black Zetsu. With that, the two left the mindscape soon enough. Since Orochimaru's technique failed, he vomited a mouthful of blood. After having vomited a mouthful of blood, Orochimaru then stared at Senju Araki before speaking, I never expected your chakra to be so powerful. I shall return again. Kushina was about to move her hand to kill this damn snake, but Araki turned to her and silently shook his head. He understood why the snake Sanin had said those words. He was making a performance in front of someone. And that someone could only be Black Zetsu. A seal on his right hand started glowing. At that moment, his vision started to expand. The radius of his vision around his body continued to increase. Araki felt as if he was receiving all the information of the three-dimensional space around his body. The radius wasn't too large. It was merely a little more than 30 meters in range. Even though he had just used this technique, Araki felt a head-splitting pain. The reason why he experienced such pain was that there was no way to filter the information that he didn't need to see. Like the fluttering of leaves, the movement of small ants, and every single useless information. This was the seal invented by the Uzumaki clan members in the Senju clan manor. Its name was, All Seeing Seal. Although it was invented by the Uzumaki clan members, even they couldn't use it because of the mind-blowing headache. Kushina could only use this seal but see a range of a little more than 2 meters of the radius. Araki seemed to be the only one who could use it effectively with 30 meters as his range. However, he was relieved when he felt that this head-splitting pain wasn't useless. It was worth it. He found that thing. That Black Zetsu. Even after finding the location of Black Zetsu, Araki took no action. He was aware that if he did move to grab hold of him right now, the Black Zetsu would simply phase through the ground and escape. The fact which infuriated Araki, even more, was that he had met up with Achiha Madara for a year ago. He had seen that man use would clone, yet he never considered the possibility that Achiha Madara had messed up with his grandfather's body. If he had known this, he wouldn't have cared about anything and just killed Madara then and there. Consequences be damned. And certainly enough, he was planning on killing Achiha Madara if he was still alive. However, before that, he wanted to catch that damnable Black Zetsu. Araki didn't know, but whenever he thought of Black Zetsu, he would be filled with dissatisfaction. He always felt like this thing wasn't even supposed to exist in the world. Just as he turned around and returned to the Senju clan manor while holding Kushina's hand. 
From the corner of his eyes, he stared at the tree where the black Zetsu was seemingly hiding. He could see it there. Lying on the ground, looking at him with those sinister golden eyes. Those sinister eyes weren't staring at himself, they were focusing on Kushina. Araki really felt like extracting those eyes and feeding them to some dog. Who did this thing think he was staring at? He was smart enough to figure out that this thing wasn't staring at Kushina because of her Uzumaki lineage. Many Uzumaki clan members were living in the world, why would this thing focus on Kushina, though? There was only a single answer. Kurama. It was Kurama who was probably this thing's target. Araki had no idea why Kurama was the target, but he didn't care at this moment. He would get those answers once he grabs hold of this black Zetsu. Around this time, even the black Zetsu had no idea that another Araki was sneaking towards him. He was meticulous while moving and seemed to make sure he was quiet. After he felt that he was close enough, Araki made a hand seal, and the earth below them rumbled strongly. Black Zetsu was immediately surprised and was about to phase through the ground when suddenly, he felt that its body couldn't phase through the ground. Just as it was about to run away in some other direction, the tree near its position changed shape and grabbed the Black Zetsu with a massive hand-like structure. Even the Black Zetsu felt that it was being held by this large hand made of wood. Greetings, Black Zetsu. How has Uchiha Madara been since that time? Araki icily said while coming forward to greet this damnable thing. Send you Araki. The Black Zetsu's round golden eyes stared at him with a hint of hate, what is the meaning of this? Do you want me to spread the information about the remaining Uzumaki clan members? Go ahead and do so. This threat doesn't work on me anymore. Firstly, I want to see whether you can escape right now or not. Araki said before a seal on his left hand glowed, and he went forward, you won't be leaving this place now. Humph. Do you think a seal like that would work on me? Black Zetsu stared at Araki in contempt. However, Araki's wood clone didn't stop. He continued to move forward, and suddenly, the black Zetsu faintly recognized the seal. His eyes widened as he shouted, this. This is the seal for trapping shadows. That's right. I have understood your true nature. You aren't a living thing, you are a shadow. A shadow which has been given form by some strange power. Araki seemed rather proud as he didn't stop his movements while speaking. This was something the Uzumaki clan members in the Senju clan manor had invented on Araki's demand. You have, indeed, understood my true nature. But. You made one more mistake. Black Zetsu said before it suddenly started to merge with the wooden hand which held it firmly. Merging with Mokutan? This was absurd. This was the first time Araki had seen something like this happening. He had a great belief in his Mokutan. He thought that with it, he could suppress Black Zetsu for some time. But he never expected that this Black Zetsu would merge with the tree holding him. After having merged with the wood, Black Zetsu let out a strange laugh, you don't even understand the true nature of your wood release. Not even Senju Hashirama understood that. Why do you think that the wood release can suppress the bijou and almost all type of chakra, while no other chakra can? This question really did shook Araki. Although he knew that Black Zetsu was making fun of his ignorance, he didn't take those to heart. What mattered was that there was a chance that he was telling the truth at this moment true nature of his wood? Indeed, why could his wood element suppress any chakra? Was it because it had formed from the strange balance between two elements? This wasn't right? He had heard that Anoki and the second Suchikage had created Jin Tun, dust release with the combination of three elements. However, there had never been any reports or even rumors of Jin Tun suppressing a Bijou's chakra. Why could the wood release suppress the chaotic Bijou's chakra? It was at this moment that the Black Zetsu realized that Araki had fallen into deep thought. He internally cursed himself for blabbing right now. Maybe he should have just remained quiet. The Black Zetsu now decided to leave. Araki didn't spare him a glance, not like he could prevent him from leaving. It was better to plan his next move. With that, the wood clone dispersed as well. When Araki inside the mansion received the set of memories of this wood clone, he furrowed his brows. It seems that there were more mysteries related to his wood release than he imagined. However, he decided to think of it on some other day. Right now, he had another thing he must do. He sent his consciousness inside Kushina's seal. There, he saw the large fox, seemingly sleeping at the moment. Surrounding the large fox was a massive forest which Araki had created in these four years. 
Araki noticed that upon his arrival, Kurama's ears perked up a little. However, seeing that Kurama had still not woken up to greet him, Araki understood that Kurama was just faking his sleep. Looks like you are asleep, Kurama. And here I was thinking of letting you have your chance at revenge. At a guy named Achiha Madara. The grin on his face widened when Kurama immediately raised his eyes with an excited yet an angry look in his red eyes. Mind repeating your words? Kurama said, not at all sure whether he should believe Araki's words or not. This was far too much? Araki merely smiled in response at Kurama's question. It had been nearly four years since he had entered this place. It was the same cave where he had met Achiha Madara for the first time. Just like before, he sensed similar sinister chakra from the inside of the cave. However, the power behind the sinister chakra had lowered a lot. This proved that Achiha Madara was indeed dying. Araki and Kushina were the only ones going inside this place. It was because the other Uzumaki clan members could find themselves in trouble against Achiha Madara. Soon enough, Araki stood in front of the legendary man who had fought against his grandfather and survived the battle Achiha Madara. Ho! Oh, you are here again? And this time, you have come with a companion. That chakra? A Jinchuriki, huh? Achiha Madara casually glanced at Kushina as he said this. Kushina felt an extreme pressure directed at her, but she didn't show it on her face. Inside of her, Kurama angrily growled, Madara. Unfortunately for Kurama, only Kushina could hear his shout. However, Madara did notice the reddish glow of chakra on Kushina's body. A strange smile surfaced on his face as he asked, Is that you, QB? Kushina felt a little strange while Madara stared at her. He hadn't even opened his eyes, but she felt such enormous pressure on her body. Only with Kurama's chakra did she feel like she broke apart from the pressure. It was only then that Madara changed his target and stared at Araki, looks like you haven't come with any pleasant thoughts in your head. So speak, why have you come here? Achiha Madara, I never cared about the reason how you survived the battle against my grandfather. It wasn't related to me. Even you would release, I didn't care about it. However, I heard something interested today. Orochimaru received my grandfather's cells. Tell me, Achiha Madara, how did you get my grandfather's cells? Pure rage could be seen in Araki's eyes. It was not the slightest bit inferior to the rage in Kurama's eyes. Upon sensing this, Madara was a little amused. He said, how the roles have changed. Instead of me, the QB seems to be supporting you. And the QB even seems to be willing. He said because he saw the reddish glow on Kushina's body darken. She was already in the Four Tails mode. So, I take it you have come to kill me? Well, I simply need to inform you that I am not that easy to kill. As he said that, a blue warrior's avatar covered Madara's body. This was precisely Madara's Susanu. But it wasn't the perfect Susanu. Perhaps, even Madara knew that he wouldn't be able to use a perfect Susano with his current condition. Two spears of pure blue-colored spiritual power appeared in the Susanu's hands, and these swords were slashed against the ground. As the swords clashed against the ground, the bluish energy was emitted from the sword, and it was targeting Araki and Kushina. Kushina jumped away quickly while forming a Bijidama near her mouth. Meanwhile, Araki jumped on the other side while clapping his hands and shouting, would release, would dragon jutsu. Both of these attacks hit the Susanu which covered Madara's body. A massive explosion occurred after it made contact with the Susanu. Madara though remained indifferent to this attack. He made a sealess shadow clone. He wasn't going to make the same mistake as before of using a wood clone. The shadow clone didn't use the Susanu. Instead, it was going through a series of hand seals which would be impossible to follow even through a Sharingan. After having completed those series of hand seals, Madara took a deep breath in before shouting, Fire release, Majestic Flame Destroyer. A sea of fire was coming towards Araki and Kushina. Knowing that this was the signature jutsu of Madara, Araki and Kushina didn't dare to be negligent. They both quickly went through a series of hand seals and shouted, Water release, dual tsunami. Just as the flames were charging at Araki and Kushina, a massive wall of water was raised. This wall of water charged at those incoming sea of flames. Those two collided against each other, and a lot of steam was created, which practically blinded everyone. However, Madara's shadow clone didn't stop moving. As if knowing exactly where Araki and Kushina were, 
he charged forward in an attempt to fight them in a taijutsu battle. Araki didn't hesitate to pull out his sword and charging at Madara. His kenjutsu style had been polished after repeatedly being trained by Hitaki Sakumo. He truly was the best kenjutsu expert of Konoha. Meanwhile, although Madara's shadow clone could move without restraint, his shadow clone was also suffering from the side effects of age. He wasn't as powerful and nimble as he used to be. After deflecting Madara's moves for some time, Araki sent sealess wooden spikes through Madara's shadow clone, instantly dispersing him. Before the steam dispersed and Madara created another clone. Araki and Kushina turned their heads to face Madara. That bright glow of Susanu seemed to be highlighting his position. Moreover, the fact that he couldn't move right now because of those hoses just seemed to make them even more confident. Kurama switched and took control over Kushina's body for some moments. He charged the Bijudama as well. However, unlike the Bijudama, which had been used by Kushina earlier, it was a lot larger. The chakra Kurama used while making the Bijudama himself was lower as well since no matter how much Kushina trained, she couldn't control Kurama's chakra as skillfully as him. Meanwhile, Araki clapped his hand and shouted, would release, multiple wood dragon jutsu. The wood dragons were created from underneath the ground and charged at Achiha Madara along with the vast Bijudama. This time, the explosion would be massive enough to cover a large area, so Araki quickly went through a series of hand seals and shouted, would release, wood dome jutsu. With that, he covered himself and Kushina with a dome of wood. A massive explosion occurred which completely destroyed the whole place. Except for Araki's wood dome jutsu, everything else in the vicinity of one mile was destroyed, leaving only ashes behind. Well, that was what Araki and Kyubi thought when they felt the shockwave of the explosion. However, their heart clenched when they heard an amused voice, that was an exciting dance near the end of my life. Araki's eyes widened, and he opened up the dome. Kurama was about to jump at Madara, but he noticed the signs of life flickering in Madara's body. Even though he was on the verge of death, Madara spoke with a smile, I guess I can't continue dancing anymore. This mortal body has reached its limit. We shall meet again, Senju Araki. With that, the remaining life force of Uchiha Madara died out. Araki was sure that Uchiha Madara was dead for good this time. Kurama showed off a satisfied expression before returning inside the seal. While Kushina stared around, Araki went towards Uchiha Madara's standing corpse. He opened Madara's eyes and was surprised to find them hollow. Araki was a little surprised that Madara had no Sharingan, yet he could use Susanu. He remembered seeing it in a record from his granduncle Toborama that Susanu was a Manjiku Sharingan's ability. However, Araki guessed that Madara's mastery had reached such a profound level that he could use Susanu without even a Sharingan. Araki was somewhat confused at whether he should inform the Uchiha clan about Uchiha Madara. But in the end, decided against it. He burned the entire body of Uchiha Madara then and there, deciding to leave no traces. The cells of Hashirama which had fused with Madara's body also burned there. What made him rather curious was the fact that he couldn't find Black Setsu around. Meanwhile, even though quite a lot of things had been blown off to smithereens because of Wood Dragon Jutsu and Bijudama, there was one thing which still remained. Something which confused Araki and Kushina immensely, it was that giant statue with which Madara's body was connected. What the fuck is this thing? It still didn't get destroyed after all those explosions? Araki looked quite incensed while he stared at the giant statue. This statue gave him a feeling of boundless strength and suppression. This was the first time he felt suppression from something. Noticing that Araki was focusing on the statue, Kushina also turned her eyes towards it. For some time, she remained quiet, having a talk with Kurama inside of her. Oh I brat, let me switch over. I need to tell Araki about this. Kushina didn't hesitate in giving him control. It was rare for Kurama to ask for control over her body. She felt that if the fox did know about this statue which interested Araki, then that would be good. Red colored slits appeared in place of Kushina's pupils. Kurama had taken control now. He spoke, Senju Araki, what you see is the husk of Jubi. This is the thing from which I and the rest of the bijus were created. Araki's eyes widened in shock when he heard Kurama speak. Jubi? Meaning ten tails? Moreover, the creation of Kyubi and all other tailed beasts? You are telling me that this is the thing which has created you? 
Who could do that? Or did you just split up someday? Araki asked Kurama with a curious expression. Kurama remained silent for some time before he spoke, looks like I need to narrate a lot of things to you. About what Bijus are, and also the true history of Senju and Uchiha clan. With that, Kurama started to narrate the history of the Senju clan and Uchiha clan. Araki kept on hearing the history from Kurama's mouth. He understood a lot of things. Like the fact that the Sage of Six Paths really existed. The man named Hagamoro Atsutsuki. Until now, he had thought of that man as a fantasy. Since he wasn't really sure if a man of that power existed or not. Yet, Kurama clarified he did. And the legends were no exaggeration. However, he was quite surprised when he found out that this sage of six paths had a brother named Hamura Atsutsuki. According to Kurama, Hamura went to the moon with his descendants to keep this ghetto statue out of mortal's reach. Araki snorted at those words as he thought, yet it ends up in Madara's hands. However, he didn't say anything to Kurama and continued to listen patiently. Even Kurama had no idea at how Madara could get this ghetto statue which was supposed to be at the moon. As powerful as Achiha Madara was, even Kurama didn't think Madara could go to the moon and bring Ghetto statue here. After that, Kurama started to narrate about how the Senju clan's ancestor, Azura Atsutsuki and Achiha clan's ancestor, Indra Atsutsuki. Both were children of the Sage of Six Path. One had inherited his strong body, while the other inherited his talent and ocular vision. During the time when Sage of Six Paths was giving his inheritance, he chose Azura as his inheritor. Indra flew in a rage stating how he was more deserving and all. They fought and, with the powers of everyone, Azura won at the end. Indra disappeared after that battle, and his descendants took up the clan name of Achiha. While Azura's descendants took up the clan name as Senju. And since then, the battles between the two clans had gone through many generations. Until, it was finally resolved at the generation of Senju Hashirama and Achiha Madara. Araki already knew the story ahead because of his grandmother. He raised his head to stare at the ghetto statue. So, this was the husk of ten tails. The tailed beast formed after combining all the nine tails. Araki now understood why that black Zetsu was staring at Kushina. From what he understood, that black Zetsu wanted to seal the Kurama inside this ten tails. Was this someone's sick plan of reviving the ten tails? Do you know of something known as black Zetsu? This time, it was Kurama's turn to be startled. In all his life, he had never heard the name of this being. What was it? So, he shook his head negatively, no, I am not aware of anything known as Black Zetsu. I see. A little disappointed that Kurama wasn't aware of Black Zetsu, Araki started walking towards the ghetto statue. Kurama spoke out with a hint of anxiousness, don't touch it. It could steal your chakra. However, as Araki touched the ghetto statue, nothing happened. Araki raised his brow at what Kurama said and responded, there isn't anyone here to control the ghetto statue. It can't steal my chakra with no one to control it. And then, he felt the rough structure of the ghetto statue. It was wooden. However, he could feel that this wood was different. No matter how much he wanted to, he couldn't control this wood. It was like the density of this wood was hundreds of times more potent than his own wooden chakra. Maybe that was an exaggeration, but it did make Araki a very anxious. Noticing that Araki was a little anxious, Kurama said, don't worry so much. Even if Madara could control this ghetto statue, he isn't alive anymore. You can finally relax? As long as it doesn't get the chakra of all the nine-tailed beasts, it won't be able to do anything. However, Araki didn't think Kurama was right in this. It was because he remembered Madara's last words before his death, the words which were still somehow haunting him. We shall meet again, Senju Araki. Perhaps Kurama could shrug it off, but he couldn't. He didn't know why, but he had a faint feeling that Madara would return. Or maybe he had faked his death, and this was just a blood clone. But wait. Why would Madara let him find the ghetto statue, though? These questions confused him a lot. And he wasn't going to get their answer in any short time. However, leaving the ghetto statue here was just going to be utter foolishness. That was why he asked Kushina to return and send a whole team of Uzumaki clan members specializing in sealing chakra, like things. He remained at the location where ghetto statue was and tried to send his chakra inside of it to see if it would respond or not. After sending nearly half of his chakra in the ghetto statue, 
his consciousness entered a dark place. Araki had let his consciousness enter Kushina's mindscape a lot of times. He had also seen the mindscape of Orochimaru. Although it wasn't a pleasant place, he felt that it was far better than his current location. This was pure darkness. Araki couldn't see anything in this pitch black darkness. He could feel his chakra but couldn't exit this place through it. Right now, he felt his consciousness was falling in a bottomless cliff. There seemed no end to this. Although he didn't want to, Araki felt like he had no choice now. He had to feed this thing even more chakra for it to show a response. The moment it does, he was going to recall his consciousness to his body. And just like that, Araki kept on sending his chakra into the ghetto statue. Only when he felt like 90% of his chakra has been eaten by the ghetto statue did he feel something. A faint reddish light hits his face as he raises his head a little. In the sky, far beyond his position, he saw a crimson eye opening with nine tomo. The color in tomo reminded Araki of Sharingan. However, Sharingan clearly couldn't match it in terms of power or anything. At that moment, he also sensed the way to return. With no hesitation, Araki controlled his consciousness to go that way and get out of this ghetto statue. After his consciousness returned to his body, he realized he was drenched in sweat. That was quite frightening? Araki also realized something. He understood why Uchiha Madara stole and injected himself with Hashirama cells. It was because Madara wanted to evolve himself. He wanted to gain the power equivalent to the Sage of Six Paths. At that moment, Araki wondered he grabbed hold of Grandpa's cells to unify the Senju and Uchiha clan in his body to transcend and reach the equivalent power to Sage of Six Paths. If Madara was able to control the Ghetto statue, I should be able to do the same with my wood release. At that moment, he remembered something. It was in his grandfather's scroll of jutsus. His grandfather had many would release jutsus, but there was one jutsu he had mentioned that must never be used without acquiring the sage mode. Sage art would release, true several thousand hands. Sage mode. Perhaps this could assist him in transcending above the world. After acquiring sage mode, there was a chance he could have enough chakra to connect to this ghetto statue and control it. Just as he was thinking of this, Uzumaki clan members arrived. They were shocked to see the ghetto statue, but upon Araki's order, they immediately got to work. They tried out many seals before one of them worked. The ghetto statue was sealed inside a golden vase. After that, 13 seals were placed on the entrance of this golden vase just to prevent it from opening. This vase wasn't something special or any instrument left behind by Sage of Six Paths. The reason Uzumaki clan members could seal the Jubi's husk into this golden vase was that this husk contained no chakra. The only chakra it contained was the chakra it recently received from Araki, and it was dispersing quickly because there was no one to control that chakra. After having sealed the ghetto statue, Araki asked them to return to Kanoha. Although Araki wasn't sure if this would keep the ghetto statue inside the seal, there was nothing more he could do. 13 was the most number of seals could stack on top of each other. Moreover, these 13 were the best seals which were available in the Uzumaki clan. Yet, Araki had a faint feeling that this wouldn't be enough to contain that boundless power. The strength which had suppressed him entirely at that moment. He had heard from his grandmother Mito that his grandfather was able to suppress 8 bijou at the same time with his wood release. The only remaining bijou, the one-tailed beast was left behind because it had already been sealed by Suna village. There was no way the one-tailed beast could have resisted him, though. This wasn't what he merely believed, but a fact. This meant that his grandfather may have had the power to suppress the nine-tailed beasts at the same time. Although the ten-tailed beast, which was the combination of them all would be considerably stronger with all their power condensed into one, he wondered if his grandpa would be able to defeat it or not. Closing his eyes, he took a deep breath before calming down and thinking, that thing has left a long-lasting impression on me with its power. I need to stop thinking of power for some time. I guess it would be better to let nature go along its course. After returning to the Senju clan, he wondered what he should do next. Should he go and meet his sensei Sukumo? Or go to Orochimaru before getting hold of his grandpa's cells? Maybe he could find Black Zetsu there? He closed his eyes and tried to sense Orochimaru in Kanoha. He was surprised when he felt Orochimaru's chakra nearing the Senju clan manor. Araki opened his mouth and wondered if I see. He really sent his shadow clone with grandpa cells. 
He was somewhat surprised to see that Orochimaru was so obedient. It seems Orochimaru feared him more than he imagined. Yet, just as that thought entered his mind, he shook his head, no. I can't underestimate them. In fact, I need to overestimate them. Let's see. If I was at their position? Grandpa's cells that Orochimaru sends me can be all that he has or maybe not. Let's say if he does send all the cells he has, but what if he maintains contact with that annoying black Zetsu? Wouldn't he receive another supply of Grandpa's cells from somewhere? Even in that cave, I saw no signs of Grandpa's body or his cells. Although this was all his speculation, he didn't believe he was entirely wrong. Dealing with this snake, he needed to be trickier. If only he knew that this snake had his Grandpa's cells, he could have used a better tactic earlier to force him into a dead end. Now, he was a little late to be changing tactics. He needed to adapt to the situation. Soon enough, Orochimaru's shadow clone handed over Hashirama's cells to the wood clone of Senju Araki who had gone out to grab them. The two didn't even exchange a word before Orochimaru's shadow clone dispersed. Araki's wood clone returned with a blank look on his face. Araki stared at the white mass of flesh. These were his grandfather's cells? He held that mass of flesh and got outside the mansion before burning it without a second thought. He was well aware that he could also try the method of Uchiha Madara of injecting this flesh into his body. There was also less of a chance of his grandfather's cells rejecting his body. Yet, the very thought of injecting his grandfather's cells into him nauseated him. To him, this method of acquiring power just didn't feel right. It was like making fun of himself. Perhaps the reason for using these cells for power might seem right in the eyes of men or shinobi, but he could only feel disgusted over this method. It was another sunny day in Kanoha, Achiha Kashiro was fighting against Achiha Fugaku. And for what seemed to be the tenth time of the day, Fugaku fell on the ground. He had been defeated by Achiha Kashiro, again. This was the tenth time of the day. Achiha Fugaku? He couldn't believe it. He was losing to a 12-year-old boy while he was a 22-year-old guy. He remembered it happened ever since those tournaments against the Senju Brat started, Uchiha Kashiro had started growing stronger at a demonic rate. From the day Uchiha Kashiro had that battle against Senju Araki, he had called out for Uchiha Fugaku and started training with him. Uchiha Kashiro knew that Fugaku was a Jounin-ranked shinobi, so he used his Sharingan from the start. Fugaku was well aware that Kashiro had a three-tomo Sharingan. He had unlocked it while he was on the run against some assassins. He was only five-year-old when that occurred. It was only with his Sharingan that he could keep his life against those assassins at that young age. Fortunately, another Uchiha had forgotten something at his home and returned to grab it. He saw Kashiro being attacked by an assassin and immediately went on to assist the clan head son. The Uchiha was winning the battle against that assassin when Kashiro snuck in and killed that assassin once he got the opportunity. This was his first kill. And since that attack, the Uchiha clan had increased their patrols around the Uchiha clan district. The investigation revealed that it was an assassin from a small village named Takigekir. This became a piece of huge news in the Uchiha clan, Uchiha Fugaku naturally heard of this matter as well. Since then, he had started keeping an eye out for Uchiha Kashiro. Since the battle against Senju Araki, he had started his own sparring sessions against Uchiha Fugaku. Initially, he needed Sharingan to keep up with Fugaku, and in rounds of 10, he would only win a single time. That too by a fluke and also because Fugaku didn't use his own Sharingan. However, as time passed by, Uchiha Kashiro's talent seemed to have started shining. Even amongst the Uchiha clan, he was proving to be a dazzling gem, seen rarely in the generation. Now, it was Fugaku who needed to use his Sharingan to keep up with Kashiro's speed. Whether it was his speed of hand seals or his elemental control. It had so massively improved that Fugaku could barely believe it. Moreover, Uchiha Mikoto had turned 17 years old this year. According to the wishes of the elders of the Uchiha clan, Uchiha Mikoto was to be betrothed to him. However, even though he might marry Mikoto, it didn't please him one bit. Although she was a beautiful woman, what Fugaku really wanted to be was the clan head of Uchiha clan. If the things had remained as they were before, he would have married Uchiha Mikoto and become the clan head as her husband. But, with the talent displayed by Uchiha Kashiro right now, he had little doubt about who would inherit the position of clan head of Uchiha clan. 
His talent was already incredibly brilliant. His decision-making skill was good as well. He was ambitious, and if Uchiha Kashiro did show his full power, perhaps only his father could defeat him. Or maybe that might not be possible as well. After all, he had no idea about the peak of his strength. And currently, Kashiro was staring at Fugaku with a thoughtful look on his face. For years ago, he hadn't chosen Fugaku as his training partner, just because he had drawn against Senju Araki. That did bother him, but he wouldn't choose Fugaku as his training partner for that reason. He chose Fugaku because he had heard several elders and his father discussing the matter of his elder sister's marriage with Fugaku. Kashiro wanted to keep an eye on Fugaku and see if he was worthy of his elder sister. In these four years, he had rarely seen Fugaku contact Mikoto. Moreover, Mikoto also didn't like to be in his presence. She didn't repel him only because of the wishes of the clan elders. Perhaps it was at that moment he had decided to break the marriage before it reaches fruition. He didn't know who would be perfect for his sister. No. That was the wrong question. There was no need to find someone perfect for his sister. As long as his elder sister remained happy, he wouldn't let out a complaint, even if that person wasn't an Uchiha. However, this wasn't the only reason he had to become the Uchiha clan head. The second reason was because of Senju Araki. He felt a massive pressure from Senju Araki. Every time he faced him, he felt that he didn't stand a chance against him. There was also a secret concerning Senju Araki that have never been mentioned in the entire clan. It was that each time Senju Araki had lost, he would turn into wood. For the first few times, it confused Uchiha Kashiro and Uchiha Kazuma. However, soon enough, they understood, Senju Araki had stopped coming to the Uchiha clan personally. He would merely send a wood clone with a large quantity of chakra. After the fight against Uchiha Kashiro, Senju Araki would disappear from the arena, so many people figured he had left quickly during the smoke. Although both Uchiha Kazuma and Uchiha Kashiro came to know of this fact, they hid it from their fellow clan members. It would be quite a blow to them. Uchiha Kazuma was quite worried about the mental state of his son after knowing about this. After all, Senju Araki hadn't even come personally to fight him. But, it seemed that his worries were baseless. Uchiha Kashiro cared little about whether he defeated Senju Araki or not. This whole competition felt more like a farce, but he was going along with it anyway. Besides, he was sure that the Senju clan was sure to prosper under the leadership of Senju Araki, that is why he felt like he must grab the reins of the Uchiha clan to make sure the Uchiha clan would rise as well. He didn't know how Fugaku would rule, but he held absolute confidence and arrogance in himself. He was sure that the Uchiha clan would rise to even greater heights under his own leadership. After having defeated Uchiha Fugaku, he returned to the clan. He buried himself in the library and started ready books related to politics while keeping his Sharingan on. He was well aware that if this knowledge was required to let the Uchiha clan rise to great heights. Araki had started training his wind chakra training. His hundreds of clones were training his wind chakra and managed to cut apart a waterfall after training for one month. Sakuma was satisfied with his progress. It was tens of faster than he expected. It wasn't every day that someone could master an element for which they didn't have any affinity. Currently, Araki was seated within a vast forest created by himself. He was keeping his eyes closed while seated there. Suddenly, the blades of wind started to shoot out of his body. Many of the trees around his body were slashed by these wind blades. These wind blades didn't pierce the trees, but they did manage to cut apart quite some bark of the tree. The blades slowly grew fiercer and managed to cut apart the first trees which came in contact with them before their power considerably lowered. The wind blades suddenly lost much of their sharpness. Instead of their sharpness, there was a hint of softness around the wind gusts. As these wind gusts touched the leaves, some of the leaves were slashed to pieces. Araki increased his control over the wind, and soon enough, the leaves stopped getting slashed into pieces. Instead, they were gently gliding with the wind. Sharpness and softness? I guess I need to practice the softness part, even more, to make it useful in my taijutsu style. Araki said while staring at the forest around him. I wonder how long the rakage is going to hold himself back. It has already been one month since those Kumo envoys returned. When is the declaration of the war gonna come? Araki shrugged his shoulders before getting ready to leave. 
Currently, the third Hokage met up with Shimura Danzo. With a decisive and resolute tone, he asked Danzo, were you the one who launched that attack against Senju Araki which forced him to utilize that explosion? Danzo didn't answer that question, in turn, he asked the third Hokage, why did you allow them such free reign over these years? If you had ordered Hataki Sakumo, he could have grabbed Senju Araki and brought over here. With him in our custody, the QB wouldn't have dared to make a move. He seemed to spit on the third Hokage's decision while also calling Kushina as QB. Well, he couldn't be blamed for the foul mood. Half of his personal agents had suddenly disappeared. And he had a faint idea that it was the Senju clan who were involved in that matter. The Hokage remained silent over this question. He could have indeed done that. Knowing Hataki Sakumo's loyalty, perhaps he would have brought Senju Araki to the Hokage, tied in chakra restraining things. However, there was also a small chance that Sakumo wouldn't fight against Araki for real and let him go. The man valued comradeship much more than that of a mission. If he did let Araki go, there was no telling what Senju Araki would do in response. He had quite the control over Kyuubi's Jinchuriki, so there was no point in taking any chances. Danzo was becoming a little angry as he noticed that the Hokage was ignoring him. The Hokage then coughed a little before asking, what is the news of the other great villages? At this, a solemn look appeared on Danzo's face as he replied to the Hokage, the Kumo and IWA are recruiting shinobi like crazy. Moreover, my spies have caught the information that the Daimyo of Land of Lightning has given entire authority to Kumo to declare war against Konoha. The Daimyo of Land of Earth hadn't taken such a measure, but they are still bolstering their military crazily. I see. Knowing Anoki, he wouldn't have much trouble in convincing his Daimyo to assign him war funds. The third Hokage stated with a frown on his face. When will they attack by the earliest? Three years at least. In that destruction against Yuzushio, many of their elite soldiers lost their lives because of the attacks from Kyuubi. Danzo calmly said while staring at Hiruzen. Internally, he couldn't help but curse Hiruzen and Uzumaki Mito for not giving him Kyuubi. If he had the Kyuubi under his control, he would easily be Hokage and could destroy the four other nations by now, bringing them all under the land of fire. Three years, huh? Hiruzen frowned at the short time limit. It has only been four years since the second shinobi war ended. In another three years, it would be seven years since the last war ended before a new war would start. Not just that. Many rumors are surfacing that the Hachibi has a new Jinchuriki now. Moreover, this Jinchuriki has shown better control and strength than previous Jinchuriki. The third Rakage son is also growing up rather quickly and could prove to be a dangerous opponent after another three years. Danzo continued giving information to the Hokage. It wasn't that he wanted to give this information to the third Hokage. It was because there was no choice left for him. Half of his personal force had vanished without a trace. If he withheld this information, Konoha could suffer quite a bit of destruction. He didn't want to become the head of a rundown village. Besides, he had another aim to give away so much information. It was to pressurize this monkey so that he would be forced to take drastic measures. What of the Jinchurikis in IWA? Although Hokage was surprised that Danzo was giving him such information for free, he guessed that the explosion gave him a more significant scare than he imagined. The two Jinchurikis of IWA, Han and Rashi. The Jinchuriki of Five Tails and Four Tails respectively. You are already aware of Rashi's powers, so I will skip him. Han is rather young, but he shows good control over the abilities inherited by him from the Five Tails. The steam release? Moreover, he can also use the chakra of his bijou to some extent. In three more years, he would grow up to be a great weapon. Danzo's facial expression never changed as he narrated this information. Hiruzen's expression did change, though, he thought in his head this. This could be troublesome. If we do not have the power of QB, we won't be able to resist an attack from both Kumo and IWA. And also, if the sand also takes hold of that opportunity, Konoha would be attacked by the third sides. Suddenly, his eyes widened as he thought of the last great village left, the Kirigakure. What of the Kirigakure? The Hokage asks Danzo who responds solemnly, the Kirigakure shows no signs of joining up this time. They aren't supported by their daimyo to go on another war so soon. He wants them to focus on defense and keep the economy stable. 
This, this was an unexpected boon. The Hokage said with a slight smile on his face. It would have been terrifying if they had been attacked from all sides. Hiruzen, we need the strength of Kyubi to deal with such an attack. At this moment, the Hokage remained silent for some moments before asking, Uzumaki Kushina is not a shinobi. She won't listen to my order. The only one who can control her is Senju Araki. And you and I should know who can control Senju Araki, Danzo stated while looking him in the eye. Hiruzen knew what this meant. It seems you are right in this part. If the situation does remain as it is, we will have some serious issues on our hands. Besides, her presence would also be a boost for our military and medical strength. The third Hokage said to Danzo. So, who will you send to recall her back? I don't think Jiraiya or Orochimaru would be appropriate. Jiraiya is far too soft to say anything drastic to her, and I doubt Orochimaru will even agree to go. Danzo asked the third Hokage clearly. The third Hokage showed a determined voice and said, I, myself, will go. Only I can convince her to return to Kanoha and once again face the war for Kanoha. Meanwhile, he was thinking, moreover, there are some things that only I can tell her and not Jiraiya or Orochimaru. She needs to inherit the Senju clan and become the head. At that point, even Senju Araki wouldn't be able to refuse her. Maybe, I could also interfere in the matters using my status as her sensei. Several reasons were revolving in the third Hokage's scheming head. And with that, he called for Jiraiya and asked for the current position of Senju Tsunade. Jiraiya took nearly three days before he returned with information of Senju Tsunade's position, she is in a city named Fujigata with a young girl named Shizun. This girl is Tsunade's apprentice and Kato Dan's niece. Senju Tsunade? If you asked a shinobi about her, they would call her an excellent medic and a strong shinobi, she was after all one of the three great Sanin. However, if you asked a gambler, they would respond that she was a legendary sucker. She had never won a single gamble against anyone in which she bet wealth or personal property of hers. Because of the wealth inherited by her, all kinds of gamblers were excited to gamble against Tsunade and win some money. It was quite surprising that although Senju Tsunade had never won a single gamble, she was still not under debt. It just proved how much wealth she had inherited. Well, it had only been six to seven years since she started gambling like crazy. So, she still wasn't in debt. Nobody knew of the future, though. Currently, while she was preparing to pack up from Fujigata and move from this city with her niece, she was approached by a surprising individual. It was none other than her sensei who had come. She knew that Kanoha's state must be quite dire for her sensei to come here. She asked the third Hokage, Why did you come here, sensei? You should know full well why I am here. What I want to ask you is when do you plan on returning, Tsunade? The third Hokage asks her clearly Shizun who noticed that it was her sensei's sensei, she immediately goes to fetch some water for the old man. I won't be playing some games right now, Tsunade. Return to Kanoha. The third Hokage stared at Tsunade with a resolute and stubborn look in his eyes. Tsunade was quite surprised when she saw how adamant her sensei was being. She spoke with a relatively helpless tone, why? It has only been a few years since I have left. I still haven't gotten over my fear of blood. I don't think I will be that useful to Kanoha. After saying that, she was about to turn away when the third Hokage spoke, I won't be hearing your excuses Tsunade. During that time, I let you go away in your sorrow because I believed this journey would be better for you to get over it. Since you haven't resolved those issues yet, it seems that this journey was just useless. Before Tsunade could say anything, the third Hokage continued even further, Kanoha will face a significant threat in the upcoming years. Your presence is necessary, Tsunade. Oh, really? Isn't there my cousin who is the Senju clan head in Kanoha? He has even recruited quite a lot of people in the clan. Do you really need my presence there? Tsunade asks offhandedly. Although she didn't want to get involved in some fights, she did keep herself updated with the news and rumors of the Senju clan which has seemingly been revived. The Senju clan? The Hokage's face turned ashen upon the mention of the Senju clan. The Senju clan shows no sign of supporting Kanoha in this upcoming war. The Hokage stated to Tsunade, careful in his words, though. Huh? Why? Can't you just order their head? Your seat has quite a lot of authority, you know. Tsunade offhandedly said to the Hokage. Apparently, even though she was keeping tabs about the Senju clan, 
she was still unaware of a lot of things. The Senju clan head, your cousin, isn't a shinobi of Kanoha, so I cannot order him. Moreover, as the Senju clan head, he has certain powers to overrule my order. I am sure you are aware of that, Tsunade. The Hokage looked really helpless when he mentioned it to Tsunade. Tsunade was naturally aware of those powers. Previously, she had used one of her powers as the heir to Senju clan to even run away from Kanoha. You still aren't completely helpless. I mean, your powers are even more than that of a clan head, whether it is Senju clan or some other clan. You could still order him to assist you during the wartime. Tsunade was knowledgeable about the rules and regulations of Kanoha. It was a rule set up by her granduncle Toborama to let the whole authority rest in the Hokage's hand during the time of war. You are right. I can use the pretext of war to order the Senju clan head. However, the rest of the clans would start becoming more cautious against me. To them, it will seem as if I am trying to strip the power away from a clan head. Moreover, that rule also states that I can only order them once the war has been declared or Kanoha will declare war within one year. The war is still three to four years away. This seems to make the third Hokage even more helpless. How are you so sure that the war is three to four year away? Tsunade didn't understand how her sensei could know that. Since when did he change his job to a fortune teller? Danzo has given me information about the war preparations going on in Kumo and IWA. As he said IWA, a dark look appeared in Tsunade's eyes. The war against IWA was the one where she lost Nawaki and Kato Dan. She clenched her fists unconsciously. She had still not gotten over their deaths. Internally, the Hokage seemed quite happy at this. She was showing emotions? So, it wouldn't be impossible to convince her. Around this time, Shizun arrived with two glasses of water. She handed one to the old Hokage and one to Tsunade. The Hokage drank the water while Tsunade kept on thinking about something while holding the glass. If this goes on, this war could destroy Kanoha. Are you sure you want to stay here continuing to wallow in your own self-pity while letting Kanoha face destruction, the same village which has been founded by your grandfather? The same village for which your granduncle sacrificed his life? The same village which was loved by your little brother and your fiancé to the point they were willing to die for the village. The Hokage raised his voice after every sentence, which shook up Tsunade. Tsunade. She backed away a little at the adamant feeling that her sensei gave her right now. She was sure that her sensei wouldn't back away today. Moreover, his words did touch her innermost feelings. How could she abandon this village when so many dear people to her had died for it? Noticing that Tsunade was influenced by his words, the third Hokage decides to strike the iron while it was still hot, return and take control over the Senju clan. The Senju clan members shouldn't have an issue if you take control of the Senju clan considering that you are the elder one, your power and prestige as well. If you return, the Kanoha still has a chance of survival. Tsunade nodded her head while she heard her sensei. Maybe it was finally time for her to stop looking down and raise her head to look up front. Alright, let's return to Kanoha. But you will need to give me some time to deal with my fear of blood? Tsunade said to the third Hokage. The third Hokage nodded and replied, you won't be fighting right now. Just your presence would be enough to boost the morale of Shinobi. Moreover, they would be more assured of fighting while putting their lives on the line knowing that the legendary medic has their back. He internally thought, and if Senju clan does come under you, I would be able to order both Araki and Kushina. This would be perfect. However, unknown to the Hokage or maybe Danzo as well, this time, they had blundered. They had miscalculated by massively overestimating themselves. After returning to Kanoha, Tsunade first goes to the Hokage's office. It was to clear some formalities about reassigning Tsunade as a shinobi first and giving her the exclusive rights of the Sanin again. The formalities were soon cleared by the Hokage, and she was set to go to the Senju clan manor. Shizun followed her teacher to the Senju clan manor. She was quite young the last time she had stayed inside the Senju clan manor. It was so long before for the young girl that she didn't even remember it anymore. She was quite happy for her teacher to meet a member of her family now. She had seen that her teacher was quite sad in these years. She was simply drowning in her grief, and there seems to be no end of her sorrow. Maybe she could finally move on now that she would be meeting her cousin. Meanwhile, Araki naturally sensed a familiar chakra. Although he had never sensed this chakra before, 
he could feel it was someone close to himself. Moreover, this person was walking towards the Senju clan manor. There seems to be no more than a small chakra source accompanying this person. Maybe that of a child? He understood that this person could possibly be Senju Tsunade. Just as he thought that this was his elder cousin, he unconsciously clenched his fists tightly, that monkey. He really is adamant on involving himself in the Senju clan's issues. As for Tsunade, he nearly growled upon that name. He remembered his grandmother's near-death scene as if it occurred yesterday. At that time, his grandmother wanted to see Tsunade? Araki could still tolerate that. He knew that Tsunade probably wouldn't receive the news of Mido's death that early so she couldn't return. Yet, even after months or fucking years, she had never returned to even pay her respects. This made him so angry just thinking about it. And if what he guessed was right, that monkey wanted to poke his nose into Senju clan's business by involving Tsunade. Kushina noticed that Araki was getting angry and gave him a tight hug, she also asked him gently, what happened? Her gentle voice did bring him out of his rage, and he started to calm down. Kushina, she is returning. My elder cousin? And I really don't know if I will be able to hold back myself. Araki honestly said to her. Kushina's eyes widened a little, but she didn't release him from her hug, she said, let me talk to her first. Let you talk to her? Araki frowned a little. Kushina gave him a nod and stated, yes, let me do the talking. Since you won't be able to remain calm, you wouldn't be suitable for talking to her, right? All right. This was something he had said to Kushina long before. If for some reason, he couldn't remain calm, she needed to take control of the situation since he would just make a foolish decision at that time. Kushina didn't need to think long to decide that this was the correct time for her to take control of the situation. She was well aware of how dissatisfied Araki was with Tsunade. Moreover, the fact that she had come at such a timing meant that it was none other than the third Hokage pulling strings. Unlike Araki though, she could think calmly and believed that Tsunade still wasn't aware of the whole situation. If Araki did talk to Tsunade, their arguments would probably lead to a fight. Whether Araki defeated Tsunade or Tsunade defeated Araki, the point remained that the Senju clan property would split up. And by law, even the Uzumaki clan members living in the Senju clan manor would have to go to the Tsunade's place. At some point or other, she was definitely going to realize that they were Uzumaki clan members. And it would turn everything useless? While thinking so much, she let out a sigh, Araki needs to think so much regularly. Just what sort of pressure has he been under all this time? Even I don't know completely. Meanwhile, Araki was already very thankful for her support at this moment. As Kushina's arms around him loosed, he turned towards her and hugged her as well, I trust you to do everything right. And even if something does go wrong, I will be there. Worst comes to worst, I will announce the Uzumaki clan's reappearance. Let's hope it doesn't come to that just yet, Kushina says knowing full well about the repercussions. The seals around the entrance of Senju clan manor were deactivated. It was to allow Tsunade to enter the Senju clan safely. After around 10 or so minutes, Tsunade arrived at the Senju clan manor. She started feeling nostalgic upon seeing the Senju clan manor once again. This was the place where she had spent her childhood. She entered the manor with Shizun following her closely. There? She met up with Uzumaki Aisao who said, We have been waiting for you, Princess Tsunade. Let me escort you to the clan head. He turned towards the other Uzumaki clan members, You both, take this little girl and show her the manor. This was a signal from Uzumaki Aisao to Tsunade that it wouldn't be appropriate for this young girl to enter the main hall. Understanding his signal, Tsunade turned her head towards Shizun before speaking, All right, go and have fun, Shizun. I will go and meet my cousin. Yes, Tsunade-sama. Shizun was honestly happy that she got to roam around the mansion. She wanted to see this place completely. Moreover, she also didn't want to ruin this reunion between Tsunade-sama and her family member. With that Shizun went away. Tsunade was escorted to the main hall by Uzumaki Aisao. After he had escorted her there, he was given the signal to return. Just like that, Uzumaki Aisao returned, asking no question. Tsunade stared at the man seated on clan head seat, it was her younger brother Senju Araki. Moreover, there was a chair next to his own where a young red-headed girl was seated. An Uzumaki, huh? So, you are Uzumaki Kushina. She said while looking at Kushina. 
The reason she managed to recognize Kushina was because of that red hair. This was also the same reason she didn't know that Aisao was an Uzumaki. It was because he had used a seal to change the color of his hair from red to brown. Yes, nice to meet you, Tsunade-sama. She says with a respectful tone. Tsunade then turned to look at Araki, she was surprised to see that Araki didn't say anything. He was indifferently glancing at her as if she was thin air. So, you are my cousin, Senju Araki? To these words, Araki gave no response. He felt that if he did open his mouth, he wouldn't just stop at his introduction. Since Kushina was the one who told him not to speak, she quickly said to Tsunade, Yes, Tsunade-sama, he is your cousin. He is the son of your uncle Ramatsu. Oh. I see. Tsunade felt that it was a little strange that only Kushina was talking. But, she didn't overthink about this matter. Anyway, get up from that seat. Don't you see I have returned? By right, it does belong to me. Tsunade said straightforwardly to Araki. Araki grabbed the armrest in response and held it tightly that some cracks appeared on it. Meanwhile, Kushina frowned upon hearing Tsunade's words. This was going the wrong way. Tsunade-sama, before we talk about this. I want to ask you some questions. Kushina decided to be the one to say this first. Although Tsunade didn't understand what she meant, she rolled her eyes in response, All right, I will answer you. In all this time we have been in the Senju clan manor, you have never once come to visit Mido-sama's grave. I want to ask you about this, why did you never come here? Kushina asked her with a straightforward yet gentle tone. Tsunade frowned at that question, she lowered her gaze towards the ground as she said, I did not want to return to Kanoha where many of my loved ones had died. Hearing that reason just made Araki even angrier. If not for Kushina placing her own hand over his hand, he would have really raised it against Tsunade at this moment. This. This was his elder cousin? He couldn't help but want to shout at this woman. She was beyond pathetic in his eyes now. Although Kushina was displeased as well, she tried to hide it from Tsunade's experienced eyes. I understand your reasoning. You didn't want to return to Kanoha because it brings back memories of your loved ones who died here. Alright, I will ask my next question then. By your blood, you are an Uzumaki as well. You must have heard the news of Uzumaki clan's destruction. Did you ever go to visit Yuzushio or maybe even ask the Hokage about why he never sent help to Yuzushio while you were returning with him? Kushina asked this next question with a heavy heart. Araki's eyes widened as he heard the question. He didn't think Kushina would ask this question next. Tsunade was naturally puzzled about the reason behind such a question. But she figured that since this girl was an Uzumaki, she wanted to ask this question to sate her curiosity. She replied honestly, although I have Uzumaki blood in me, I have never interacted with them. Honestly speaking, I don't have any deep feelings for them. Moreover, I can sort of understand why the three great villages would make their move against the Uzumaki clan. Their sealing knowledge was so fearful. It was even harder to learn than the medical techniques, which require perfect control and complete knowledge of human anatomy. Now, if previous words of Tsunade only angered Araki, these seemed to rub some salt on them. It was like she was purposefully making the situation harder for herself. Even Kushina clenched her fists. She couldn't believe that Senju Tsunade, someone who had Uzumaki blood in her could also have such thoughts. Half of her mind was screaming at her to just let Araki free reign. However, she still managed to control herself. She asked Tsunade her next question, you mentioned that you did not want to return to Kanoha during Mido-sama's death because it reminded of the death of your other loved ones. Tell me, Tsunade-sama, why have you come now? Tsunade was a little shaken up at this question. She didn't think Kushina would use the answer from before and put it in a question here. Fortunately, she soon found the answer to her question. Taking a deep breath, she answered Kushina, it was because Sensei himself appeared and asked me to return to Kanoha. A fierce war is about to erupt, my presence is required. I don't want to let the village founded by my grandfather be destroyed. As she said that, she stared at Araki who was seated on the clan head seat. You know, I can tolerate that you are sitting on the clan head seat. You have, after all, managed the Senju clan all these years in my absence. Tell me, why is an Uzumaki sitting next to you, though? This time, it was Tsunade's turn to ask a question. Kushina wondered if she should speak at this time or not. 
However, she didn't need to speak at this time, Araki opened his mouth, she will be my wife in the future, so her status is naturally equal to mine. Hearing Araki's casual words, Kushina couldn't help but blush. Coincidentally, the color of her cheeks was the same as her hair. She heard a laugh in her mind, you still get flustered so easily. Ha ha ha. Kushina shouted in her mindscape, shut up, fox. Don't disturb me. Brat and another annoying brat, sitting on a tree, kissing, the mental link was suddenly broken between them. And, if possible, Kushina's cheeks were even redder after hearing Kurama's words. I see. But still, you should get up from the seat. I know of what you both have done in Yuzushio. Sensei informed me of the situation briefly. I know you have inherited wood release of grandfather and are pretty proficient in it. And Uzumaki Kushina is the Jinchuriki of Kyubi. Tsunade said this while carefully gauging their reactions. Other than the deepening of his frown, Araki gave no other reaction. As for Kushina, she couldn't help but be a little nervous. Because you have inherited grandfather's bloodline, you will naturally become the Senju clan head in the future. But not now. Currently, the war is going to be upon us in nearly three to four years. You are significantly talented, but I need to take over the Senju clan and use our funds to prepare for the upcoming war. Tsunade righteously said that while looking straight into Araki's eyes. You think you are more capable than me to lead the Senju clan? Araki asked her while raising his brow. It took great effort to maintain this indifferent face while he was burning with rage. You should know that I am one of the three Sanins. I have earned my name in the second shinobi war with my strength and medical prowess. You shouldn't underestimate me. Tsunade declared it with a haughty expression. At this moment, Araki broke out in a chuckle. It didn't seem as if the chuckle was out of happiness, but a mocking chuckle, the three Sanins? What a prideful title. A title gained from a defeat and yet you three are so proud of it that I am honestly baffled at your shamelessness. After that, he said to her, elder cousin, let's go outside. Why? Tsunade asked him while frowning. She could hear that mocking tone of his and understood he looked down on her. I really want to see this amazing strength of yours, cousin. Araki still hadn't stopped with his mocking tone as he gazed at his cousin. Tsunade's frown deepened upon hearing him, but she figured it would be better to just show it to him. Kushina didn't even try to stop Araki at this point. She was well aware that Araki was far beyond his boiling point. Now, he really wanted a release of all his discontentment. After the two entered the field, Tsunade gazed at Araki and noticed that he still wasn't looking serious. Moreover, other than that disdain present in his eyes, there was a trace of hatred as well. She was quite puzzled over why he would have an angry look. All right, since this will be a competition between us, why don't we two bet something? Araki asked Tsunade with a neutral voice. Tsunade's eyes twinkled a little at the mention of a bet. She immediately asked, all right, what will we be betting? If I lose, I will hand over the Senju clan to you. I will also obey any order you have. Araki said to Tsunade earnestly. All right, what do I need to bet then? My half of the property? Tsunade asked him while raising her eyebrows. No. I am not interested in something like the other half of the Senju clan's property. He pointed his finger at Tsunade and said, If I win, I want Grandpa Hashirama's necklace. Tsunade lowered her head to stare at the necklace tied around her neck. It was made of crystal gem. You wanted to boost your wood release? She asked him with a smile. This cousin of hers was quite knowledgeable. She was surprised to see him shaking his head negatively and say, No, I don't want to boost my wood release through any external means. I have another use for this. An emotionless look appeared in his eyes as she said, Enough talk now. If you agree, we can start any time now. Well, I don't get why you would need the necklace but sure. I agree to the bet. Tsunade readily agreed to the bet, not seeing any way she would lose the fight. Both continued to gauge each other before Tsunade rushed at Araki. She was rather nimble, and her speed was also alright. Araki made no move to stop her advance even though he had multiple moves in his arsenal. He continued to gaze at her indifferently, hiding a burning rage. Just as Tsunade was one meter away from Araki, she pulled back her fist and then moved her punch to strike Araki. Araki was so sensitive to the chakra that he could sense how much strength she was using in her fists. This was probably her fearful chakra enhanced strength. Just when Tsunade was about to punch him, 
He merely sidestepped while keeping his hands in his pockets. Tsunade was surprised to see him dodge at the last moment and couldn't stop her momentum at which she rushed at him. Araki stared at her body which was going past him. His legs suddenly moved and kicked Tsunade's gut strongly. He didn't hold back while kicking Tsunade's gut, and she was thrown directly into the sky. Tsunade did feel enough pain for her to throw out some saliva, but she was stunned that Araki held enough strength to send her flying into the sky. However, she regained her calm soon enough. Although Araki had kicked her gut quite strongly, she used some technique to calm down the pain in her stomach. Although it wasn't healed, at least it wouldn't affect her capabilities right now. Thinking that she could make use of this height, she changed her body posture and spoke, heavenly spear kick. The downward force was just accelerating her momentum. Just as she was about to land her kick on Araki, once again, he sidestepped. This time, Tsunade landed on the ground, creating a massive crater over there. The shockwave was felt by Araki as well as he started wobbling a little. Tsunade noticed it and immediately moved her body to strike him this time. Araki raised one hand and shouted, Water release, Water Dragon Jutsu. A water dragon was created between Araki and Tsunade. It charged at Tsunade wasting no time. Tsunade slowed down and prepared to punch the water dragon, which was going to strike her from the sky. At that moment, she suddenly felt a strong punch on her gut once again. She lowered her head and noticed Araki standing there with an emotionless look as he punched her. Just after Araki punched her, the water dragon also charged at Tsunade. It struck both Araki and Tsunade. Tsunade felt as if a strongly pressured water was thrown on her body. However, she still endured it. She tried to open her eyes and look at Araki's condition, and her eyes widened when in place of Araki was wood. She understood what happened. Either Araki had substituted himself with a wood clone, or this wood clone was the one who punched her just now. Just as the water dragon jutsu was done, she turned her head to her left and noticed a slight movement. Feeling quite confident in her observation, she immediately jumped over there while enhancing her legs with chakra. Araki showed off a stunned expression when he saw her appearing over here so quickly. Tsunade felt proud of her observation and was about to strike him when she felt someone touching her back before hearing, water release, water prison jutsu. Tsunade was suddenly trapped in a sphere of water. She felt that the pressure on her body was quite significant while she was inside this water sphere. It restricted her movements a lot. The Araki in front of her turned into wood. Tsunade tried to move her head to her right side and noticed that Araki was there with his arm submerged in this water sphere. You can admit your defeat now, elder cousin. He said in an icy voice. Tsunade shook her head internally. The seal on her forehead expanded, black lines appeared on her face. This was Tsunade's mitotic regeneration, the hundred healings jutsu. With this, she somehow managed to shrug off the pressure of the water prison jutsu. Araki was honestly surprised to see her shrugging off that pressure. He immediately dispersed the water prison jutsu and backed away. Tsunade pursued him immediately as she jumped at him with her full speed. This time, it felt like her speed had doubled. He landed on the ground and waited for Tsunade to arrive. Taking a deep breath, he let the wind chakra condense around his body. Tsunade could feel intense pressure from wind chakra, but she could still move without any problems. When it felt like she was about to strike Araki now, Araki dodged her. No, he didn't dodge, but it felt like Tsunade had slipped a little. This was a jutsu of Araki's own creation. He named it, Wind Release, Wind Armor Defensive Mode Jutsu, and this was the first version of this jutsu. For now, he felt like he didn't need to use the other version. Araki took advantage of that moment and dispersed the wind chakra around him before swiftly kicking her away. Tsunade was kicked to quite some distance. However, this still wasn't enough to bring her down. She stood up and was about to charge at Araki when Araki suddenly joined his hands before saying, would release, would prison jutsu. This was also a jutsu of his own creation. Though, with his level of control over wood, he didn't need to spend that much time to create it. Half of Tsunade's body was trapped in a dense wooden box which restrained her movements completely. Other than turning her head, she couldn't do anything. She tried to use her immense strength to get out of this wood prison, but it turned out to be impossible. It was because she couldn't move her arms and legs at all. With no way to even minutely move them, she wasn't able to apply any pressure and break apart this wood prison. 
Araki started nearing her with an icy expression. Cousin, you didn't return to Konoha on grandma's death. Not even after her death to actually pay a visit to her grave. However, you returned to Konoha because of that monkey. You really have some nerve entering the Senju clan manor and demanding me to hand it over to you. Someone who hadn't even been here all this time. His voice was getting colder, the more he spoke. Just as Tsunade was about to speak something, he raised his hand and slapped her face hard. The sound of the slap seemed to resound in the entire field. Kushina grimaced when she heard that loud slap which struck Tsunade's cheek. He really didn't hold back on his strength. Even Tsunade was dumbfounded. All her life, there had never been one incident where she had been slapped by someone. Yet, here she was, being slapped by her younger cousin. However, that was far from what could satisfy Araki. Before she could speak anything, Araki raised that hand once again and slapped her face. This one also resounded in the entire field. I have long since wanted to slap you to oblivion. I have heard of this seal of yours, it heals all the damage on your body? But still, if I slap you, you will experience pain. I want to let you feel that pain. After having said that, he slapped her face again and again. With each slap, Tsunade's cheeks would turn red before they were healed by her hundred healings jutsu. He slapped her nearly 20 to 25 times before Kushina arrived and placed a hand over his shoulder, mumbling softly, this is enough now. Araki stopped at that moment. Tsunade was feeling the shame of her life. Firstly, she never expected to lose against her younger cousin. However, this was still fine. He had inherited her grandfather's bloodline, and she hadn't even fought in these recent years, so her senses had dulled a lot. But for him to slap her so many times, she never expected it. After having defeated Tsunade, Araki took his grandfather's necklace, since it was something he won if the previous bet was to be considered. Meanwhile, Tsunade just laid down on the ground, seemingly reflecting on what had happened. Araki didn't plan on comforting her. Though he wasn't as angry at her as before, he still didn't forgive her completely. After having entered the Senju clan manor, Araki suddenly turned towards Kushina. He neared her with a small smile on his face. Kushina was a little confused at this, but she didn't really oppose him. She was curious to see what he was up to. He raised his arm and gently slid around her neck. Soon enough, he was done. Kushina lowered her head and was surprised to see Senju Hashirama's necklace around her neck. The pupil of her eyes widened, and she looked at Araki who merely shrugged, I didn't really find anything appropriate to gift you when we do marry. This is my family's heirloom, it should suffice. Thanks, Araki. After she heard him, she went forward and kissed him on his lips. Araki was utterly stunned when he felt Kushina's rosy lips on top of his own. He didn't expect Kushina to kiss him so suddenly. However, he soon placed his hand behind her head and got lost in the kiss. Meanwhile, Tsunade was reflecting a lot after her defeat at Araki's hand. She went to the usual place where she would calm down. It was a bar in Kanoha where they served one of the best sake. It had been some time since she had started drinking sake. Maybe an hour or so. Around this time, a white-haired man joined her and ordered some sake as well. I want to be alone for some time, Jiraiya, Tsunade said, not even needing to look at him to know this was Jiraiya. With a huge grin spreading on Jiraiya's face, he said, you have finally returned to Kanoha. I don't intend to let you drown in your sorrows again. Last time, I was helpless to stop you but not this time. His voice gradually got serious and said, alright, now tell me what happened. You know you can trust me with anything. Tsunade couldn't really hold it in her for a lot of time. She decided to share it with Jiraiya. She knew he was a trustworthy friend during a crucial time. Jiraiya kept on hearing Tsunade's words while drinking sake. Hearing about Senju Araki from her mouth gave him another insight into what sort of person he is. Since Tsunade's mind was in a confused state, she didn't hide anything from Jiraiya. She spilled everything to him. After she had finished speaking, Jiraiya started speaking with an unnaturally grave voice, Tsunade Haim, don't take my words to heart. I will be giving my honest opinion about this. To this, Tsunade just nodded as she laid her head on the table while staring at him before asking him to speak. In this matter, I believe you both are at fault. You are at fault that you didn't visit your grandmother's grave even after all these years. Actually, it isn't that big of a deal for us people, but Senju Araki is a child, so he can be rather emotional about it. 
Moreover, I did hear from Sensei that Senju Araki lived with Mido for one year and loved her a lot. He must be quite sensitive about anything relating to her. The Uzumaki clan's matter wasn't that big of a deal. But even though it wasn't that big of a deal, he still unconsciously added them as reasons to be angry at you just because he was dissatisfied with you. You also didn't come to meet him even after all these years, simply drowning in your sorrow when you did have one family member left from your family line. It must have displeased him a lot. You also returned to the Senju clan after all this time just to become the Senju clan head when he has done all the work in these years. This did make Tsunade a little sad. She realized that Jiraiya was right in this. Maybe this was all her fault. However, Jiraiya wasn't finished speaking, however, I also wouldn't say that he isn't at fault as well. He didn't try to even think about your emotional state. He didn't completely understand the situation of why you have returned. These words did lift up a bit of Tsunade's stress. He is quite an emotional child. Take it in yourself and wait, I assure you that he will forgive you soon enough. I don't think he will be angry at you for long since you are his only family left from the Senju clan. He may have adopted a lot of people into the Senju clan, they, after all, don't share his blood. Don't forget you are the only other granddaughter of Uzumaki Mito. If not for anything, just this fact alone will make him come to you. Jiraiya said with a confident tone. His positive outlook and confidence did lift up Tsunade's spirit. She honestly muttered, thanks, Jiraiya. With that, she stood up and left the bar. Anytime, Haim, anytime. Jiraiya said while finishing his drink before leaving as well. He was pretty happy that he could help out Tsunade. After Tsunade had left though, there was a glint of serious look in his eyes, Sensei. You are poking too much in the Senju clan. I never expected you to recall Tsunade for such a reason. With that, Jiraiya also disappeared from the location. It was unknown where he had gone. Maybe to meet his apprentice, Namike's Minato. Meanwhile, Tsunade returned to Senju clan manor. The first thing she did was sleep soundly that night. Better to forget everything after this sleep than to meet Araki right now. The next day, the first thing Tsunade did was visit the ancestral graveyard of the Senju clan. It wasn't just because of wanting to visit her grandmother's grave, but also because of her other relatives who had been buried here. The first one she visited was her fiancé, she said a few things while facing his grave before moving towards her little brother Nawaki's grave. Speaking a few more things on Nawaki's grave, she moved towards her father and mother's grave. After that, she went to her grandfather, Senju Hashirama's grave, the man who had spoiled her rotten when he was alive. Next was Senju Toborama's grave before she finally moved on to Uzumaki Mido's grave. She remembered her grandmother much clearly than any of her other family members, maybe it was because she lived a lot longer than them. When she had received the news of Uzumaki Mido's death, she had been broken even more. She didn't even have the energy or spirit to return and face their graves. However, now that she did come here, she felt as if this was some sort of release for her. As if a lot of feelings which had been choked up inside of her had flown out with words. She never expected she would feel so much better after talking in front of a grave. She returned after having her heart-to-heart -heart talk with her deceased family. Araki did know about this fact, but he remained indifferent to her. Nothing significant happened on that day. The next day though, it was different. It was the nighttime of the second day since Tsunade had returned. Araki heard someone knocking his room's door. Without even opening the door, he knew it was Tsunade. He opened the door and stared at his cousin's sister, something you need, cousin? His voice was emotionless just as before. For some moments, Tsunade kept on staring at the face of her cousin. Now that she stared at him closely, other than that emotionless expression, she could see a distressed look which he was trying to hide. She lowered her body and placed her hand over his head which he was about to slap away but paused for some reason. Tsunade gently started speaking, I realize that I haven't been fair to you, Araki. No matter what excuse it is, I had pretty much abandoned you for all these years. I won't be telling you to forgive me so quickly, but all I can say is, just give me time, and I will make it up to you. After she finished speaking, she got up and was about to leave when Araki grabbed her hand tightly. Tsunade stared at him with a surprised expression and heard him speak, I also don't like the fact that I hit you, elder sister. I remember that grandma used to tell me about you when I lived with her. She wanted you to be there with her. I have always heard that you are a great medic. 
I thought that if you were here, you could have saved her. And if you were here, I never would have to take up such a stressful position. I? His voice choked with emotion as he stared into Tsunade's eyes with a helpless expression. Before he could continue further, he was hugged by Tsunade tightly. She kept her eyes closed and slowly patted his head, I also regret it. I really do. And I am here to make it right again. For some time, the two continued to hug each other. After the two parted, Araki wiped the few tears from his eyes before a serious look appeared on his face, Elder sister, a lot is going on that you aren't aware of. However, you must remember that you cannot trust the third Hokage blindly. At those words, Tsunade's eyes widened slightly as she asked him, what do you mean by that? Did Sensei do something to you? Araki paused for some seconds, wondering if he should reveal it to Tsunade or not. This was quite a sensitive information. In the end, he decided to tell her just a bit and hide the other parts. During the Yuzushio's destruction, Konoha didn't send its reinforcements. That's a fact you are aware of. But elder sister, the one who sold the pathway to enter Yuzushio was also Konoha. Orochimaru, your old comrade, has already confessed that he was ordered by the third Hokage and Danzo to sell the way to Yuzushio to Kumo. This was something which utterly shocked Tsunade. Although she didn't hold any unique feelings towards Yuzushio, she was aware that it was Konoha's ally. For Konoha to betray Yuzushio in such a manner, it did shock her. She knew her sensei was quite loyal to Konoha and he wouldn't be above such tactics. But still, hearing it from Araki's mouth dumbfounded her greatly. She didn't even have any idea if she could trust Araki's word that much. It wasn't that she didn't trust Araki, but she thought that someone might be fooling him. However, there was also no harm in staying cautious of her sensei. She remembered how her sensei had been adamant in making her return to Konoha. Moreover, he kept on mentioning how she must bring the Senju clan under control and start the preparations for war. And also to bring Kushina to the Hokage's office so they could think of a method to train with the Kyuubi's chakra. I will stay cautious of him. She said with a blank expression, wanting to investigate this information further. And she knew just the right person who could investigate this issue. Araki noticed that Tsunade wasn't entirely convinced, but it did satisfy him. Entirely convincing her wasn't possible unless she hears it from an even more reliable source. However, he was satisfied that at least he managed to convince Tsunade to remain cautious of that old man for some time. Alright, you can go to sleep now, Tsunade said to Araki before rotating her body and moving towards her own room. Araki also turned his body and went to his own bed. The next day, Tsunade left the Senju clan manor in the morning. It was the time when Araki and Kushina would be doing their exercise, so the two did sense her leaving the manor but didn't stop her. Tsunade kept on walking towards the center of Konoha. Soon enough, she reached her destination. It was the house of none other than the toad sage, Jiraiya. She knocked on the door to his house. Jiraiya soon opened the door while rubbing his eyes as he let out a yawn, who the heck is here so early in the morning? He really was quite annoyed at this person who had come to visit him while he was having such a good dream. However, his eyes went wide when he noticed the person. He wondered, am I still dreaming? I mean, why would Tsunadeheim appear in front of my house though? Wait, it might be a Jinjutsu. He tried to control his chakra and felt that everything was alright. Tsunade noticed that Jiraiya was pretty much dumbfounded and let out a sigh, Jiraiya, I need your help. Yes, Haim. Jiraiya was pretty damn excited knowing that Tsunade wanted his help. Although he faintly remembered their talk when they were drunk, he didn't think it would affect Tsunade that much. Alright, come meet me in the Senju clan's training ground. I will explain the situation to you and what I need you to do. Tsunade said to Jiraiya with a serious look. I will meet you in 15 minutes, Jiraiya said to Tsunade before he saw her leave the place. He immediately entered into the bath. Now. Tsunade first entered the Senju clan manor and just when she was about to enter the Senju clan training ground, Kushina arrived. Wait, Tsunade-sama. You can't go there like this. She called out for her, a little worried about Tsunade. Fortunately, Tsunade hadn't stepped into the training ground. Tsunade was quite confused why Kushina had appeared and stopped her. There are multiple seals on the ground to prevent intruders. The seals might activate if you take the wrong step. Hearing this, Tsunade furrowed her brows. The Senju clan needed to be protected by seals? 
She then spoke, I have called for someone here, though. I need to discuss something with him. Kushina then called out for one of the Uzumaki clan member, create clones and disable all the seals. Yes, Kushina-sama. The Uzumaki clan member nodded and immediately created 10 or so clones before he started to disable every seal in the training ground. Tsunade-sama, Araki asked me to hear your words. Please don't betray his trust. Kushina seemed to be pleading. Nodding her head, Tsunade answered Kushina, I don't plan to betray my family. I may have made stupid decisions before, but I will be sure to correct them in the future. At that moment, she noticed her grandfather's necklace around Kushina's neck. A faint smile appeared on Tsunade's lips as she understood why Araki bet the necklace with her. She remembered how that necklace had changed owners. She hoped that this curse wouldn't take Kushina's life now. Soon enough, Jiraiya arrived at the Senju clan's training ground. He noticed Tsunade was waiting for him near the center of the training ground. After Jiraiya arrived, Tsunade turned her head towards him and said to him, You arrived earlier than what you said. A grin appeared on Jiraiya's face as he said, I wouldn't dare to make Tsunade Haim wait for me. Tsunade clicked her tongue upon hearing him and decided to ignore his nonsense. Jiraiya, tell me what you know of Yuzushio and its destruction. And I want to know everything. This time, Tsunade sternly stared at Jiraiya whose eyes widened a little. Jiraiya responded to her, I don't really know everything about Yuzushio and its destruction, but still, maybe I do know a lot. He reorganized all his thoughts, wondering from where he should start. After a bit of time, Jiraiya started speaking, let's start from this. As you know, the Yuzushio's destruction occurred at the hands of Kumo, IWA, and Kiri under the pretext they were eliminating a future enemy. I have gone to Yuzushio personally on a diplomatic mission, so I remember there were seals placed all around the village which would make it quite difficult to reach that island. I could only enter because Sensei did give me the way to Yuzushio. When I did hear the news that the three great villages are making their move against Yuzushio, I wasn't that worried. I mean, as far as I am aware of, no Uzumaki is living in these villages. And with no one to guide them, they shouldn't be able to enter the village. Jiraiya said, quite casually. The pupil in Tsunade's eyes narrowed a little as she heard Jiraiya's words. However, imagine my surprise when a few days later, I hear that Yuzushio had been destroyed. This wasn't all though. There was another news which spread in all the elemental nations. I am sure you have heard it as well. The news of how the inheritor of Senju Hashirama's bloodline and a Jinchuriki fought against the three great villages, dealing massive casualties to them. Jiraiya said with a serious look this time. Tsunade had indeed heard of this rumor. She knew that it was her younger brother Araki and Kushina. It was definitely the current Senju clan head and your cousin brother, Senju Araki. The Jinchuriki was most probably Uzumaki Kushina who holds the QB. Jiraiya finished speaking while staring at Tsunade. I see now. Tell me, Jiraiya? What's the chance that it was Konoha who betrayed Yuzushio? As Tsunade asked this question, Jiraiya's eyes widened for some moments before they returned to normal. To be honest, Haim, I think it's quite likely that it was Konoha who did betray Yuzushio. Jiraiya said with a somewhat bitter smile. Before Tsunade could ask anything further, he clarified, during that time, the three great villages had terrible relations with Konoha. I heard rumors of how these three great villages were planning on making a move against Konoha. I informed this to Sensei, and I don't know what he did, but suddenly, these three great villages changed their target from Konoha to Yuzushio. Tsunade's eyes widened in shock, she was smart enough to understand what happened. She clenched her fists tightly while staring at the serious expression of Jiraiya. She knew that Jiraiya wouldn't be lying to her about this matter. He had no reason to lie to her or even hide the facts at this time. Who do you suspect the most? She still asked while trying to keep her voice as calm as possible. However, the faint killing intent still leaked from her body. Jiraiya let out a sigh before saying, I wouldn't say I am very sure about this. But I had put my bets on Danzo. He seems like the person who wouldn't think before selling Yuzushio to our enemies just so he can preserve Konoha. As for the other person, you are aware of him already. Sensei. Tsunade nearly growled upon saying that word as her whole aura leaked out her body. 
The fact that she heard from Araki that the third Hokage wasn't trustworthy and had a hand in Yuzushio's destruction seemed to have solidified after hearing Jiraiya's suspicion on the third Hokage. Jiraiya's suspicion usually meant that he was 60 to 70 percent sure. Tsunade Haim, do not make a rash move, right now. Jiraiya warned Tsunade with a stern look in his eyes. Just when he noticed that Tsunade was about to say something, he added, do remember that even if you do confront him about this, he would simply refuse to admit it. He also controls all the shinobi in Kanoha. Tsunade snorted at Jiraiya's words, even Sensei can't order the shinobi to make a move against Senju clan. Almost everyone knows in Kanoha that it was founded by my grandfather. Jiraiya nodded his head, and even agreed with her, you are right about that, Tsunade Haim. In normal circumstances, even the Hokage can't make a move against the Senju clan or maybe any clan. However, the situation would be different if you make a move first. If my guess is right, at this moment, Sensei wants to find a reason with which he can label the Senju clan as rebels and put them down. Tsunade now understood what Jiraiya was talking about. I see now. Tsunade suddenly started chuckling. It was sort of a bitter chuckle as if she realized something. Now I understand why Sensei was so anxious and wanted me to return to Konoha. The Senju clan is not under his control, and he wants me to control it. If it was before, I might have even obeyed his instructions. Tsunade said with a hint of anger on her face. <laughs> Jiraiya didn't really give his opinion on this. This might have been the case. He thought for some time before asking Tsunade, I know you are angry, Tsunade Haim, but restrain yourself. After all, if you don't do anything, even Sensei would be helpless. Don't worry, I know how to differentiate between anger and foolishness. But, when I do get the chance, he won't be able to escape from my fists. Tsunade said with a hint of ruthlessness. Alright, Jiraiya. Thanks for telling me about this. Tsunade was indeed grateful to Jiraiya for telling him such information. Jiraiya grinned mischievously upon hearing Tsunade's words, it would mean a lot if you don't kill me next time I peep on you. Tsunade's eyebrow twitched upon hearing Jiraiya's words, and without even think much, she swung her fist and hit his abdomen strongly. Jiraiya was thrown far away after being hit by Tsunade. Though he seemed to be mumbling, I really did miss this version of Tsunade. After he was thrown away, Tsunade let out a sigh. She then turned towards the Senju clan manor and noticed Araki standing there, observing her quietly. Araki came closer and asked her, Do you trust my word, elder sister? I do, Tsunade told him before she followed him inside the Senju clan manor, so? What is your plan, right now? Naturally, it's to prepare for war. Araki gave her a shrewd smile while walking inside the manor. Bah? Against whom are you planning to fight first? You have a long list, after all. Tsunade asked him with a curious look. The third Rakage likes to fight and wage war a lot. It would be a pity if he died before we fight. So, the first one I will deal with is Kumo. But not now. I need a few years to finalize my preparations. Araki said with a ruthless smile on his face. The first thing Araki asked Tsunade to do was to start her training. Moreover, he wanted her to train in Lightning Chakra or maybe Wind Chakra first. He felt these two affinities would be perfect for Tsunade since she liked to fight a Taijutsu battle. With these two affinities, she could boost her speed. This was the main reason he won against her. If her speed was sufficient, and she had managed to hit Araki, there was a chance, he would be fatally injured. After a few days, Araki decided to meet Sakumo at this time. He was alone while moving towards Sakumo's house. Soon enough, he entered the house. He could feel that Sakumo was inside the house. He was near his wife, but the aura of his wife was strangely weak at this moment. Kakashi was probably sleeping in the other room. As he slowly stepped inside, Sakumo turned his head towards the door and asked with an emotionless voice, Who is it? Sensei, it's me, Araki said from behind the door. He knew that Sakumo must have heard his footsteps. Oh. It's you, Araki. Kumi said. The door opened, and he saw Sakumo seated on a chair next to his wife's comfortable bed. His wife's complexion was slightly red, and she was taking quick breaths. A little worried, Araki asked Sakumo about his wife's condition, what happened to her? I don't know. She just isn't feeling well from three days. I have shown her to multiple medical shinobi in the village, but no one can cure her. 
Just from his voice, Araki could feel that Sakuma was greatly distressed. Maybe I can help you out in this matter, Sensei. He said in a reassuring manner which made Sakumo turn towards him in confusion. Are you going to push your chakra in her and see if it heals? Sakumo asked Araki while trying to keep his voice calm. Araki responded, I will naturally try out, but if it's a disease, I don't think my chakra will do much to it. This did make Sakumo sigh out in depression, but he knew this was the best Araki could do. However, Araki wasn't done yet, he added, but, I can ask my elder sister, Tsunade to take a look at your wife's condition. I am sure she should be proficient enough in treating your wife. Tsunade? At that moment, Sakumo remembered that Tsunade has returned. Hope lit up in his eyes as he remembered that Tsunade's medical prowess was the best in the village. He was about to pick up his wife and take her to Senju clan manor when Araki places his hand over Sakumo's shoulder before saying, You don't need to take her to Senju clan manor. My sister has been informed about this matter and should be coming here anytime soon. Sakumo understood what he was talking about. The connection between Araki and his wood clone. He used it to inform Tsunade that she must immediately come to Sakumo's house. Tsunade soon arrived at Sakumo's house. She greeted Sakumo before she started to check up his wife's condition. Araki and Sakumo walked outside the house. Alright, why did you come here today? Sakumo asked him with a straightforward tone. He was aware of what Araki had done in these months. I only wanted to know of your stance, Sensei. Are you going to take up the Hokage's side or mine? Araki frankly asked him this question. It depends on what your stance is. If you are planning on rebelling against Kanoha, then I am against you. If not, I can stay out of this matter. Sakumo responded with a light-hearted tone. Rebelling against Kanoha, huh? I wonder what you mean by that. I will be frank with you, Sensei, sooner or later, I will fight the third Hokage. And I won't show him any mercy. Araki said with intense killing intent in his eyes. If you make the first move against the third Hokage, I will fight against you, Araki. And I also won't hold back. There was a sense of seriousness, as Sakumo said this to Araki. However, if it's the third Hokage who orders to destroy the Senju clan, I will go against that order. At that time, you can consider me your ally. Not in any other case. Sakumo finished speaking to Araki. Alright, Sensei. I will respect your decision. Don't worry, even if we end up as enemies, I won't ever touch your family. Araki truthfully said while staring at Sakumo. He turns around and decides to return. Is that all you wanted to say? Sakumo asked him with a bitter smile. Araki turned his head and nodded. After a few hours, Jiraiya, the Toad Sage, appeared in the Senju clan manor. Along with him was his blonde-haired apprentice, Namikaze Minato. Araki was quite curious to why these two would appear in the Senju clan manor, but nonetheless, he let them enter. Jiraiya stared at Araki for some time. The two seemed to be gauging each other quietly. Just as Jiraiya had expected, there wasn't a hint of naiveness in Araki's eyes. The only thing he saw was a cold rage. He felt as if he was looking at a compressed rage which would blow up anytime soon. Finally, Araki opened his mouth and asked Jiraiya, Why have you come here, Jiraiya? Is there something you need? Jiraiya rubbed his nose and started speaking, Actually, I didn't come here for myself. It's for my apprentice. You see. My apprentice wants to check out the flying Raijin Jutsu of the second Hokage. Flying Raijin Jutsu? Araki asked with a blank expression. He remembered it was that teleportation jutsu of his granduncle Toborama. It was quite challenging to learn this jutsu. Even amongst the Uzumaki clan members, only a few have managed to understand it. Araki stared at Minato and wondered if Minato could really learn it or not. It's a jutsu which was made by my granduncle Toborama along with my grandmother Mito's help. Are you sure he can learn it? It's quite complex even for seal masters. Araki said while looking at Minato and Jiraiya's face. Jiraiya nodded his head and said, I have already taught Minato most of what I know about seals. And now, he wants to take a look at flying Raijin Jutsu and experiment. Araki thought for some time before speaking, hmm. As you know, it's a Jutsu exclusive to my Senju clan. I can't really hand over the clan Jutsus to you. Knowing that he was right, both Minato and Jiraiya let out a sigh. They believed it was worth a try. 
However, a smile appeared on Araki's face as he said, however, it would be a different matter if Minato joins the Senju clan. At this, both Jiraiya and Minato's eyes widened in surprise. What did this mean? As I said before, Minato needs to join the Senju clan to learn the flying Raijin Jutsu. I wonder if you are willing, Minato? He questioned Minato with a gentle gaze. Minato felt a frightening pressure over his body, but he kept his expression calm while saying, I am simply an orphan. How can I join a reputed clan like the Senju clan? He raised this question near the end of his statement. However, Araki merely shook his head, you misunderstand something, the fact that I can give you an offer of joining the Senju clan is precisely because you are a war orphan. You have started to train in your wind and lightning affinities as well. Another two to three years of effort, and you might master them. At these words, Jiraiya and Minato's eyes widened. The fact that Minato was training in wind chakra was known in Kanoha records, but not about the lightning chakra. It was supposed to be his secret. They didn't understand how Araki was aware of such information. Was he spying on them? You don't need to overthink so much. The reason I know about your elemental affinities is because of my ability as a sensor. I can sense that Minato's wind and lightning affinity in his chakra is quite a lot stronger than his other three affinities. It would mean either he has a bloodline related to wind or lightning, or he has started his training in these elements. To this, Minato could only describe it as a frightening ability. He could understand that Araki wasn't telling them the complete truth. If he does have such a fearful ability, he could even predict the attack his enemy would use with the flow of his chakra. It meant he would be half a step ahead of his enemy at all times. So, what is your response, Minato? Araki asked Minato. Minato had to think for some time before he asked Araki, it's an incredible offer, and I can barely resist it. But what are the cons? The smile on Araki's face widened, it seemed he was right about Minato. He really was smart. You would need to resign as a Kanoha shinobi. I don't really care about whether you want to use Senju as your family name or not, it will be your choice. You will need to listen to my orders. Hmm. That's all I had to say. Araki said with a casual look on his face. At this, Minato frowns and said, I don't have any issue with this other than the fact that I have to resign as Kanoha's shinobi. I want to become a Hokage, so I can't resign as Kanoha's shinobi. Araki didn't like how Minato said this resolutely. From his tone, he understood that Minato wasn't going to back down. At this moment, Jiraiya intervened before Araki spoke anything, why do you want Minato to resign as a Kanoha shinobi? Because he will be under that Hokage otherwise. I don't want the Hokage to be able to order Minato. Araki didn't hide it from Minato and stated it in front of him. Minato was a little confused about why Araki wanted that. However, Jiraiya knew the reason, he nodded his head, very well then if that's what you want, I will use my rights as a Sanin to pull him out of the Genin team which has been assigned to Minato and make him my only apprentice. With this, Minato won't need to obey Sensei's orders unless he has my agreement. Araki understood what Jiraiya wanted to say, he stared at Jiraiya before speaking, all right then, however, this will have its own consequences. After all, I can't just trust your word on it right? Jiraiya did expect this, and asked Araki, so, what are you going to do? With a ruthless look on Araki's face, I will be placing a seal on Minato's body. If he does betray the Senju clan, I will kill him. Jiraiya's eyes widened, and he immediately stood up with some anger in his eyes, you think I will let you place such a dangerous seal on my apprentice's body? He could take that seal upon himself, but not on his apprentice. However, at this time, Minato chuckled a little, Sensei, you are getting too excited. Didn't Araki say that he will only kill me if I betray the Senju clan? Besides, as a shinobi, you should know that acquiring information comes at a price. The fact that I can acquire the second Hokage's Jutsu just by risking my life is already a pretty cheap price. Before Jiraiya could even say anything, Minato said to Araki, as long as you don't make me do something immoral, I promise to abide by your orders. However, the day I feel that your order has crossed the limit, like killing innocents for no reason, I won't hesitate to go against you even if you can kill me with that seal. The clear and resolute look in Minato's eyes showed just how determined he was. For some reason, Araki had a feeling that Minato would really go through his words. Well, I guess that's good enough from you. 
I didn't expect you to agree so easily, though. Araki said to Minato before adding, I will call someone to draw the seals on you. After that, you can study any jutsu you want. After that, he turned towards Jiraiya, don't get riled up so much, I won't be killing him unless he betrays the Senju clan. If he doesn't, we are good to go. It's not like I have something against him. He shrugged at the end, and Jiraiya calmed down a little. You could threaten him with that life-threatening seal on his body, Jiraiya said while looking at Araki. Araki shook his head and replied, as your apprentice just replied, I won't be able to make him do something he doesn't want to. He would prefer death than do such a thing. I also wouldn't want to kill a talented member of my clan. So, don't worry about it too much. It's just an assurance. Jiraiya looked at Minato and asked him with a worried expression. Minato gave him a reassuring smile. He really was okay with it. Only after that did Jiraiya sit down. Araki had a small smile upon his face. He was a little happy upon seeing Jiraiya's reaction and the fact that he cared for his apprentice. A seal was placed on Minato's back, and Jiraiya kept on observing the whole process. Although he didn't have any idea about the seal, he was still proficient enough to understand what would happen once the seal activated, and he found no issues regarding the seal. A seal was placed on Araki's right shoulder. The seal was in such a manner that Araki couldn't accidentally activate during his fight or so. After having been given the seal, Minato was handed the scrolls of the flying Raijin Jutsu. Araki even told Uzumaki Aisao to help Minato and solve any problems he might encounter. He was a little excited. If Minato did manage to master this Jutsu, he would have a great shinobi under him. As for why Araki didn't learn this Jutsu, he found it far too complicated for himself. But, since Araki also didn't want to be helpless against someone who could use a space-time ninjutsu, that was why he asked the Uzumaki clan members to invent a counter seal for the space-time ninjutsu. The seal they invented was on the left shoulder of each of the member of Senju clan member. This was an anti-space-time seal which would suppress all space-time ninjutsu within 50 miles or so of the radius. He wasn't the only one with this seal, all the Uzumaki clan members had this seal on their body somewhere. Now that he had dealt with Minato and Jiraiya's matter, Araki dismissed them and requested for some Uzumaki clan members. After meeting up with the Uzumaki clan members, he followed them to the underground location where they had kept the root shinobis. Well, they were all dead now. Upon seeing that all the Danzo's root shinobi had died, Araki felt a sense of emptiness, this is really sad. Every day, I would hear their shouts and screams while they were in this chakra suppression cage. I even handed them special pills to not die of hunger, but it seems that this has come to an end. What do you all say, should I capture some more of Danzo's men? Araki asked them with a light tone. The other Uzumaki clan members shivered a little. Although their screams and shouts were music for Araki's ears, the same could not be said for the Uzumaki clan members. Um, isn't this enough, clan head? One of these Uzumaki clan members said to Araki. Araki though shook his head and replied, maybe I should end this whole farce. With that, he went closer and sealed their bodies in a scroll. Since they were corpses now and were classified as non-living, they could easily be sealed in scrolls. After that, he left the clan manor. Currently, he was going towards the latest hideout of Danzo. He really wanted to give Danzo a medal of stupidity. Did he really think that Araki wouldn't be able to sense underground? Meanwhile, since it had been a month, Danzo had naturally declared his missing shinobi as dead. With the seal on their tongues, he knew they wouldn't be able to say anything about his organization, so it didn't matter. Their loss was quite substantial, but they needed to move on now. Kanoha was going to be involved in a war after all. However, at this time, he heard the screams of his shinobi stationed outside the underground cave. These shinobi were hiding in the trees and planned to strike anyone who approached the cave. Yet, they never expected that the trees on which they were standing would suddenly stab them. A few of them even considered it to be a Jinjutsu and tried to dispel it. But soon enough, they realized it was no Jinjutsu. This was a reality. And they knew only one man in Kanoha could control trees. Although they had been given the training to become emotionless tools, they couldn't help but gulp down in fear. At that moment, they felt another unbearable pain when the tree branches started moving and pulling out their intestines. Araki was casually walking towards the cave while he kept on controlling the trees mentally. Meanwhile, 
Danzo was coming out of his cave with a lot of his shinobi behind him. Except for Danzo, everyone else's eyes widened in shock when they noticed it was Senju Araki. Perhaps only Danzo could retain his calmness at this moment, and he asked, Why have you come here, boy? Why, huh? That's an interesting question. Well, I guess I should return this to you first. He pulled out a scroll and sent his chakra. Instantly, several hundreds of heads, appeared in front of Danzo. These? These were the heads of his root shinobi who had gone missing. Although he had declared them dead, he had still kept a small team to search for them. This was half of his root ANBU force, which he had created while keeping it hidden from that old fool's eyes. What did you gain by killing them? Danzo asked while staring at Araki. The reason he asked this question was that he wanted to imply that his subordinates couldn't even speak anything about him or the root organization. This meant that even if Araki captured them for extracting information, it was all useless. But, Araki chuckled at that question, confusing Danzo. Araki said with a smile, some music, satisfaction, and, it's really pleasing to see you so angered, Danzo. You think that this affects me? How naive. Danzo says to Araki while keeping a calm face. Ah? You don't have to hide it in your heart. I know how much it does affect you. I can practically feel your heart burning with fury. Do you know why I have personally come here? I was wondering if you really do dare to attack me or not. Araki asked Danzo with a grin on his face. He even started to walk forward. You can't row me up with this. He couldn't help but back away a step when he noticed that Araki showed no signs of stopping. Even after he backed away, Araki still stepped forwards until he was standing right in front of him. There was only an arm's difference between them. The shinobi around Danzo didn't move, they were waiting for his order. Hmm. Araki then said, you know Danzo, I met Orochimaru and heard some interesting information from him. Like how you both have been experimenting on Uzumaki clan members' bodies. He is lying dash, just as Danzo was about to finish speaking, he was given an uppercut so strongly that a few of his teeth fell out of his mouth and he was thrown far away. It was so sudden that Danzo couldn't even guard against that attack. Welp, with that lie, you have pretty much sentenced yourself to death. My patience has ended, Danzo. Araki said while releasing a tremendous amount of killing intent. Just as Danzo was about to order his shinobi to attack Araki, he noticed they had all been bound by thick wood vines. All of them were resisting bitterly, but they couldn't get out of those vines. Moreover, the vines were absorbing their chakra. Moreover, as Danzo tried to move, he found that a wooden vine from underground had struck his thigh. He felt as if it was sucking his blood, his vitality, and his chakra. Do you like this? This is my own creation. I can not only suppress the chakra in your body but also absorb your blood, chakra, and vitality. Don't you feel as if your life force is slipping rapidly? Araki asked Danzo with a grin. Sure enough, Danzo was feeling as if he was aging rapidly. In a few more minutes, his body would age another year. Along with age, a sense of sluggishness was felt in his body. It was like he hadn't trained for a long time. Even Danzo started to panic when he experienced this feeling. And while he was panicking, he didn't see Araki moving forward. Araki kicked Danzo's head as if it was football, or soccer. This time, his remaining teeth broke when Araki's kick made contact with his head. When Danzo looked up and stared at Araki, he saw an icy gaze in Araki's eyes, if you think you will get an easy death, then you are dead wrong. He kicked Danzo's body again. And this time, he didn't stop. He continued to kick his whole body so many times that if someone were to count it, the number would surpass 100 in a matter of minutes. However, it was surprising that even after such a beating, Danzo remained alive. The wood vine which had stabbed Danzo started injecting him with a strong life force which had been stolen from him earlier. And soon enough, Danzo's wounds started healing. They were healing at such a rate that even Tsunade herself would have been dumbfounded. Danzo was surprised at why Araki was healing his wounds. Was Araki planning on letting him off? However, he soon realized just how wrong he was. Danzo soon realized just how wrong he was in his imagination. After Araki healed him using the life force, he once again started a brutal series of kicks and punches. Around this moment, many other shinobi of Root Umbu arrived and noticed that Araki was beating their leader. One of them even shouted at Araki. Hey! Stop! 
Araki concentrated for some time before speaking, would release, deep forest emergence. Instantly, 300 or so vines of wood appeared from the ground and stabbed the chest of Danzo's shinobi. These shinobi tried to move but felt strength leaving their body quickly. This was because these vines had started to absorb their chakra, blood, and vitality. Araki stared at Danzo and said, You have been so kind as to raise so many people for me. I will be absorbing their blood and vitality completely and heal you every time you are about to die. Danzo shivered at the very mention of this. Did this mean? He raised his head and saw Araki looking at him with an icy glint in his eyes. As I said before, you won't have an easy death. He started kicking Danzo mercilessly. Every time Araki brought Danzo to the near-death state before healing him. Even though half a day had passed since Araki had started beating Danzo, he had also healed him 50 or so times. Meaning, Danzo was brought to near-death state 50 times. Now, while he was being healed by Araki, he gathered all that chakra he could and cut apart the wood vine stabbing his thigh with a wind blade. Araki was a little surprised when he felt his connection with Danzo broke. Danzo pulled out a kunai and threw it at Araki who didn't even bother dodging. Just as the kunai were about to strike his head, it was repelled away by a powerful pressure from wind chakra. I guess that's enough now. Araki raised his hand and opened his palm before pointing at Danzo, let's try out my new wind jutsu. I wonder if you will like it. Wind release, great breakthrough jutsu. Danzo used this attack and sent a high pressured wind attack at Araki. Araki also used his own wind attack. Wind release, a thousand blades jutsu. To counter the high pressured wind attack charging at him, Araki created thousands of wind blades which cut apart Danzo's wind jutsu and struck him. However, Araki's wind blades ultimately lacked the power to pierce Danzo's body which had been bolstered by his chakra. That was rather disappointing. I guess I need to add more power. Hearing that Araki could strengthen those terrifying wind blade, even more, Danzo grew a little fearful. He felt it would be better to just run away. A few smoke bombs appeared in his hand, and he threw them on the ground before making a run for it. At that moment, he heard a cold chuckle, you are rather stupid, aren't you Danzo? You think smoke bombs would be enough for you to run away from my grasps? Don't forget that I am a censor. You sealed your fate the moment you met me that day in front of Hokage's office. After that, every attack on the Senju clan or on me was just adding fuel on your funeral fire. Araki appeared from the smoke while staring at the panicked look on Danzo. Your time has ended, Shimura Danzo. Araki said this was the last sentence Danzo heard before he saw a faint flash and his body was cut apart into two. Araki was on the other side of his body now, and he stared at the red blood on his sword. Filthy, TCH. He threw away the sword which had this filthy blood. There was no need to take it home. Now, what to do with you all? Araki turned towards the 300 or so vines which had absorbed the blood and vitality of Danzo's men completely. The men were dead, but the vines still had their vitality. It would be a waste to let it remain like that. Instantly, an idea appeared in his head, and he used his chakra to grow these 300 vines into huge trees. Well, I guess it will be quite useful to me. The life force in these trees can be considered life-saving. With that, he walked away from the location. Nobody other than him would be able to utilize the life force in these trees, so it didn't matter if he kept them here or not. Soon enough, he returned to the Senju clan manor, where he saw that Tsunade had returned. He asked her, is her illness all right now? It was a liver problem. I have suppressed it for today. Tomorrow, I will be able to deal with it entirely. Tsunade said while yawning. It seemed that she was tired since she had been training in the morning and treating Sukumo's wife in the latter half of the day. Araki returned to his room and slept. He was pretty happy with this day. Not only did he manage to recruit a talented shinobi in the Senju clan, but he also killed Danzo. The death of Danzo remained a secret from the world for a week or so. It was contributed to the fact that his hideout was quite secretive. The only reason Araki knew about it was that he had been keeping an eye on Danzo and his movements. Moreover, his sensing ability was quite a boost. The first one to know about Danzo's death was unsurprisingly Orochimaru. It was mostly because he had come to ask for Danzo's assistance about some matters. However, all he found were massive trees in that area. As he got closer, he saw Danzo's body thrown in some corner. Just from the state of how things were, 
he understood it was the work of Senju Araki. Orochimaru didn't dare to stay in Kanoha for a second longer. He knew that the reason why Danzo was targeted was most probably the experiments on Uzumaki clan members. Although Senju Araki said he won't target him for five years, there was no telling when that eccentric brat would attack him. Maybe Senju Araki's patience would end the next day, and he would come to kill him. Or was Senju Araki waiting for him to do something? Orochimaru started growing fearful of this threat looming over his head. He needed to do something about him. If not fight Araki, he needed someone strong enough to defend against Araki. He thought of several schemes in his head and finally decided to leave Kanoha. Even though Senju Araki was an excellent sensor, there was no way he could sense him from a country away, right? Poor Orochimaru had no idea that Araki had naturally considered that. The second one who came to know of Danzo's death was none other than Sarutobi Hiruzen. It was two weeks later after Orochimaru found it. Needless to say, the old man was shocked and completely infuriated. He understood from the trees around that location that this was done by none other than Senju Araki. The old man, Sarutobi Hiruzen, was absolutely livid as he found out that Danzo had been killed by Senju Araki. Even though there was a slight possibility that Senju Araki didn't personally kill him, he definitely had a role in Danzo's death. Although the third Hokage wasn't fond of Danzo's presence, the man had his talents. His methods were messy, but he got the job done. Moreover, he was aware of quite a lot of weak points about the other villages. To know that they had all vanished into thin air, naturally, the third Hokage grew angry. It has been nearly three weeks since Tsunade returned. Don't tell me she couldn't even become the head of the Senju clan? Or was this on her order? He really was so angry that he couldn't even decide who he should blame at this moment. Clenching his fists tightly, he ordered sent a message to Tsunade through one of his guards to meet him in the Hokage's office. They needed to have a long discussion. It soon reached the Senju clan manor. A smile appeared on Araki's face as he thought that old fool finally found that Cyclops body. I thought I would have to inform him of his death myself. And then, he thought about the message from the Hokage, is he calling out for Elder Sister to scold her for not having restrained me? Does he think that Elder Sister has managed to become the clan head? Alright, I will be going. Don't mention anything about this note to my Elder Sister. He said to the Uzumaki clan member in front of him who had handed over this note. Yes, clan head. We won't mention it at all. With that, Araki walked out of the Senju clan manor. It would be an excellent opportunity to see that old monkey's face. Araki wondered, is he boiling with anger, I wonder? Will he attack me upon seeing me? He was a little excited upon thinking that. If the Hokage did attack him, that would simplify a lot of things. Well, I just need to make sure that many people see him attacking me. At that time, even Sensei wouldn't be able to hold it against me. Soon enough, he did reach the Hokage's office. The third Hokage had informed his secretary that Tsunade would be coming and to let her in immediately. However, her eyes widened when she saw it was the Senju clan head, Senju Araki. She wondered if she should stop him here or not. After all, from the Hokage's words, he had a meeting arranged with Tsunade. She thought that Araki was somehow unaware of this meeting and had come. Araki-sama, the Hokage has scheduled his meeting with Tsunade-sama. Please come later. Hearing the words of the secretory, Araki paused for some moments before turning towards her. Don't worry, I have come regarding that meeting. You can think of me as representing my elder sister. Well, although he didn't need to reply to her, Araki still did it anyway. Maybe because he was amused at her question and decided to humor her. And Araki entered the door, there he saw the old monkey looking seated on his chair, reading some sort of document. As the door opened, the Hokage raised his head to look at who it was. Preferably, it was Tsunade? Alas? It was the person he least wanted to see. Instantly, a tremendous amount of killing intent overflowed from his body, which covered his whole office and other departments near it. Many people who were sensing this killing intent for the first time simply fainted, while the rest struggled to breathe. Unconsciously, all of them knew who it was. The only man present in Kanoha to be able to unleash such killing intent here was none other than the third Hokage. The man who had mastered all five elements to a frightening degree, the man who had already seen two great shinobi wars, the one titled as, The Professor, because of his knowledge of many jutsus. 
For them, it was quite a surprise, since they had never sensed such dense killing intent from the third Hokage. Just who could anger him to such an extent? Araki stared at the third Hokage with a blank expression, although the killing intent was quite dense, it was still nothing compared to the pressure he sensed from Uchiha Madara. Although that man was on his deathbed, his killing intent and the oppressive pressure around him was still denser than the third Hokage's current killing intent. He said with a light-hearted tone, your killing intent does nothing to me. So, I fail to see why you are still keeping it up? Do you want to kill your own shinobi? Well, it would make me quite happy if that's your plan. In response, the third Hokage opened his mouth, I called Tsunade here, not you. As he said that, the killing intent slowly retraced. There was some logic in this boy's words, he thought. My sister was busy, so I have come here. Besides, I am the Senju clan head, don't tell me I can't hear things on my sister's behalf? Araki glared at the Hokage before taking a seat right in front of him. So, speak now. What did you want to say? He questioned while placing both his legs on the table. This. Araki's current action seemed to be infuriating the Hokage even more. If nothing else, the Hokage wanted to twist those legs and crush the bones. Since it's you, you need to tell me why have you killed Danzo. The third Hokage asked Araki while trying to keep his voice as calm as possible. Araki raised his hands and casually shrugged, that old man attacked me a few times in the village. I simply returned the favor, but why is it my fault when he couldn't even handle it? You should know well enough that your current action has weakened Konoha even further. War is already approaching us, and you still can't be mature enough to endure. You will be bringing utter destruction upon Konoha. The Hokage said this quite passionately, but it didn't seem to affect Araki in the slightest. At that moment, the third Hokage continued, your actions would have disappointed your grandfather and granduncle greatly. They both loved the village immensely. They would have been devastated to know that their grandson would because for Konoha's destruction. The third Hokage decided to use the family card on Araki as well. He remembered it worked quite well upon Tsunade. Maybe it would be even more effective on Araki. Well, the third Hokage's words did accomplish something. But the result was not something he desired. Araki glared at the old man. He could have tolerated almost anything that the third Hokage said, but for him to involve his family. He really was testing Araki's tolerance. His original motive for coming here was to force the third Hokage to make the first move against him. However, now, he was finding it incredibly hard to stay his hand. This old monkey was so damn irritating that Araki felt like the third Hokage's punishment must be even fiercer than Danzo's punishment. Do not disappoint them anymore. Use your power for Konoha, and I will forgive you for killing Danzo. We can still save it. It was really mind-boggling just how the third Hokage could speak this while noticing the look on Araki's face. You have blabbered for quite some time, old monkey. It's my turn now. Araki folded his right leg on top of his left leg before starting with a cold glint in his eyes, now, you just said something which struck my nerve. Let me start from there. You just mentioned how my grandfather or my granduncle would be disappointed in me, right? Oh please. It's nothing compared to how much you have disappointed them. No, scratch that, I shouldn't expect something from a monkey. In fact, they are the ones who have disappointed me. Araki said to the third Hokage with a glare. The third Hokage was astonished to hear his response. But he returned Araki's glare and was about to respond when Araki continued, I still can't believe my granduncle chose you as the Hokage. Moreover, you and Danzo are his students. I really do find it impossible to believe. He was such an intelligent man, yet he couldn't find no one better than a shitty monkey to pass on his Hokage seat? Was he drugged at that time? Because no way he would make such a shitty decision if he was sober. These words did make the third Hokage stand up in anger. Araki was pretty much cursing him without any pretense at this moment. However, Araki wasn't finished, he continued to rant. Well, as for my grandfather, I heard he sold the tailed beasts to the other villages to balance the powers of each of the shinobi village and create a peaceful world. Admirable move indeed. But, did he really think that peace would come after acquiring splitting the tailed beasts between the great villages? Why the bloody hell would they want the tailed beasts if they really wanted peace? And the only place they can even use the tailed beasts is in war. 
Splitting the tailed beasts and giving them to other villages was like declaring the start of future wars. I really don't understand what was going in his head, maybe the situation was different, but really, if my grandfather's dream was to create a peaceful world, then he chose to trust the wrong people. History is proof, considering we have witnessed two great shinobi wars and another one is on the verge of start. Araki ranted while cursing in front of the third Hokage. The third Hokage's brows twitched upon hearing those words. This was Araki's answer to his previous words. And this felt less like an answer but more like a slap on his face. The third Hokage said with his voice containing anger, the words of a brat really cannot be taken seriously. You don't understand anything at all. At least I am more reliable than an old monkey. You know, when I see your miserable face, I pity you. But the moment you open your mouth, I get so angry that I just want to fly in the sky and explode. Araki exclaimed, he was speaking it in such an angry voice, as if he couldn't wait any longer. You are testing my patience now, Senju Araki. You have not only spoken badly about me, but also about my teachers. I won't tolerate this anymore. The third Hokage said, while concentrating all his killing intent at Araki. You think I care at this moment? You were the one who involved them in this conversation? You want to attack me? Just who do you think you are threatening, old monkey? Kume, attack me. Heck, this has gone long enough. I will attack you. Now, Araki stood up while releasing his full aura as well. This monkey was seriously getting on his nerves. Did this monkey think he could suppress him with his chakra? He got another thing coming. Did this monkey think that he feared him? Then come. The two fiercely glared at each other. Both wanted to charge at the other and tear him to bits. The third Hokage hadn't been so angered in all his life. And as for Araki, initially, he was somewhat satisfied after killing Danzo, but he never expected this old man to lit up his fury. Just when these two were about to jump at each other and start a fierce fight, they heard, Yo! The great Toad Sage, the gallant Jiraiya is here. Both Araki and the third Hokage turned towards the only window of the Hokage's office where they saw Jiraiya seated with an obnoxious grin on his face. Upon seeing him, Araki calmed down a little. Perhaps he realized that he had lost control of his emotions here. Meanwhile, the third Hokage glared at his disciple, Jiraiya, why have you come here at this time? And how many times have I told you to use the damn door? Don't mind the small things, Sensei. Anyway, I found some interesting info for you. Jiraiya said with a wide smile on his face despite the heavy atmosphere in the Hokage's office. He soon walked closer to Araki's position and bent down to his level before ruffling Araki's hair and saying, Hey, isn't this brat Tsunade Haim's brother? Why are you still here? Didn't you hear that the great Jiraiya-sama has brought important information for Konoha? Now quickly scram and let me talk to Sensei. Araki's eyebrows twitched a lot as Jiraiya ruffled his hair. However, he understood the hidden message in his words. Jiraiya was basically telling him to go away while he would handle the third Hokage. He was making a performance in front of the third Hokage so that the old man wouldn't realize that the two were familiar with each other. Araki gave one last look to the old monkey before leaving the office. He had a faint idea of what they were talking about. After Araki left, the third Hokage stared at Jiraiya and asked him, Jiraiya, this better be some news or else. He left the threat hanging, but this didn't worry, Jiraiya. Maybe because he was just that sure about his information. Jiraiya nodded his head and started speaking, one of my contacts was approached by Hanzo's men. It seems that Hanzo wanted to talk to you regarding a deal he had with Danzo. What did you say? This was news for the third Hokage. He never expected Hanzo to be in contact with Danzo. Moreover, a deal? What kind of deal? Yes, it seems Danzo had a deal with him that he would send Shinobi and help Hanzo keep the entire aim under his control. Danzo had sent 70 or so Shinobi to Hanzo, although it wasn't a high number, but they were at least Chunin rank and could even contend against Lo Jounin. Jiraiya said with a grim tone. The third Hokage frowned upon hearing Jiraiya's words. He had heard no mention of 70 Chunin rank Shinobi being sent to aim. Danzo had never consulted anything about this matter. The third Hokage thought, this was probably his personal force he created right under my nose. It looks like he had developed it quite a lot if he could create so many men without my knowledge. However, another question appeared in his head, 
And he asked Jiraiya, what of Hanzo? What did he promise in return? Danzo wouldn't send so many of his personal shinobi for no reason. At this, Jiraiya nodded his head and responded, in turn, Hanzo had promised that he would assist Konoha in defending against IWA attack. I see. The third Hokage fell into deep thought. Although he was displeased that Danzo had created his personal force and developed it without his own knowledge, he didn't think that his deal with Hanzo was bad. Hanzo was a powerful man. The shinobis under him weren't so bad. And although AIM's strength wasn't that great as compared to a great village, it was also nothing to scoff at. With some assistance from Konoha, they would be capable of holding back the might IWA army. Hanzo has said that he is willing to continue that deal with you, Jiraiya said to the third Hokage, who remained silent for a few moments before nodding his head. Give him my answer that I agree to this deal. In fact, I will be sending a group of 100 elite shinobi to aim in a week. The third Hokage said this to Jiraiya. Currently, the most respected clans in Konoha, except for the Senju clan had been informed that they must choose two members of their clan. These two members will join the members from the other clans and leave for AIM in a week. The Uchiha clan also received this information. However, instead of the promise of two members from the Uchiha clan, they were asked to send three members. The elders of the Uchiha clan were naturally surprised to hear this. For the Hokage to be showing such favor to the Uchiha clan, it really was astounding. They felt that those tournaments against Senju Araki had really assisted them in raising their prestige enough for the Hokage to start showing special favor to them. However, the current head of the Uchiha clan, Uchiha Kazuma, thought differently. He was on a walk with his son around the Uchiha compound, son, what do you think about this issue? Uchiha Kazuma was naturally asking his son, Uchiha Kashiro, regarding the mission to go to AIM. Uchiha Kashiro thought for some moments before he replied, it does appear to be a tactic from the Hokage that shows that he favors the Uchiha clan more than other clans. However, instead of an act of favor, it's more of an act of appeasement. A sneer appeared on his face as he added, does he think we aren't aware of all he had done to destroy the Uchiha clan's reputation? This is still far from sufficient. In fact, this is not worth mentioning. Uchiha Kazuma agreed with Kashiro's thoughts and commented, you are right about this. I don't know why the Hokage would suddenly show us such favor when his previous actions or policies were always against us. Maybe he is worried about the fact that the Uchiha clan and the Senju clan's relations have improved. A serious glint appeared in Uchiha Kazuma's eyes as he said to Kashiro, but, this is also a chance for us. No. Specifically speaking, it's an excellent chance for you. Until now, you have only participated in small skirmishes. Or maybe fought against a group. However, AIM's borders touch Iwa's borders, in fact, you can be assured that multiple battles occur there occasionally. A faint killing intent was released from his eyes as he added, you must participate in those battles and attain enough prestige that it would resound in the entire Konoha. Moreover, this would also be a chance for you to evolve. You would accomplish minuscule results unless you are in some true life-threatening experiences. Kashiro dryly replied to his father, you know, you are really cold to be asking your son to have some life-threatening experiences. Are you that interested in seeing my dead body? He was only joking with his father. Experience calamity and grow? This will be my final lesson to you, Kashiro. After that, you can only depend upon yourself. Achiha Kazuma replied to his son. Kashiro obediently nodded his head. He was well aware that the teachings of his father were always good for him. Upon seeing his son's face, a gentle smile appeared on Uchiha Kazuma's face. He patted his son's head and said, If you do accomplish enough prestige there, I will give you a gift on your next birthday. Uchiha Kashiro blushed as his father treated him like a little child. But he still didn't deny the gesture. It was rare for his father to do this, so he was quite happy. After some time, he asked Uchiha Kazuma, Who will be coming with me? Um, I was thinking of sending Uchiha Shuji and Uchiha Akemi to accompany you. You are already friends with them. And, although they aren't that strong, they would assist you in terms of team coordination. Kazuma informed Kashiro about his companions. When Kashiro found out that his companions would be his friends, he was naturally delighted, but he didn't show it on his face. 
Achiha Shuji and Achiha Akemi were the children of other clan elders of Achiha clan, and in his age group, these two could be said to be his only friends in the Achiha clan. Although they weren't as strong as him, they should still be a match for Chunin. The two only had a single Tomo Sharingan, but Kashiro believed that this new experience would maybe allow them to reach the three Tomo level of Sharingan. Kashiro then had an immediate question in his mind, wait, how long do I need to stay in AIM? At this, a thoughtful look appeared on Kazuma's face, the third Hokage mentioned that the shinobi would need to stay in AIM for at least a year. Only after a year could they return. That? Kashiro lowered his head. He really wasn't happy with this, I will miss elder sister. Hearing his son's words, Kazuma's eyebrows twitched in irritation, he spoke with his voice dripping with sarcasm, nice to know that my son would be missing his elder sister more than his father. To this, Kashiro just humphed and replied, why would I remember a stinky old man like you? Elder sister is always nice to me, so I would definitely miss her more. At this moment, he remembered an important matter. Oh right. What will we do about my match against Senju Araki? Kazuma shrugged in response and replied, I will just send him a message stating the situation. He would naturally understand the reason. Besides, weren't you always dissatisfied to go along that farce? You get a break from it now. That's true. We have more or less accomplished our objective. All we have to do now is to keep good relations with the Senju clan. Kashiro agreed with his father on this. Oh and father? About elder sister's marriage with Fugaku. He spoke with a worried look on his face. He had always wanted to break that marriage contract between his sister and Fugaku. However, if the Achiha clan decided to arrange her marriage while he was in AIM, there was little he could do to oppose that decision. Don't worry about it that much, focus on increasing prestige by fighting against IWA Shinobi. Although war is still a few years later, they should still have enforced their borders with strong captains or generals. Maybe there are also A-ranked or S-ranked shinobis. It will be a significant boost to your reputation if you do kill them. At this point, Kazuma's voice was quite solemn as he added, In fact, if you do kill an S-ranked shinobi of IWA, I will name you as my successor as Achiha clan head. Do whatever you want then. Kashiro's eyes widened slightly before he nodded his head. This was good enough for him. Defeating an S-ranked shinobi meant that he had more or less reached his father's level. Moreover, with his young age, even the Achiha clan elders would be respectful to him. Breaking the marriage contract or even reforming the whole Achiha clan wouldn't be impossible. But he was also aware that with his current strength, he had a very low chance of defeating or killing an S-ranked shinobi. He felt that he needed to grow stronger even more quickly. In the Senju clan, Minato was utterly shocked as he was studying the flying Raijin Jutsu. Previously, he had studied about seals from Jiraiya. He found those seals quite interesting and learned them quickly. Minato believed that if he tried to learn the second Hokage's flying Raijin Jutsu, even if the Jutsu couldn't be used, he would at least understand the seals on it. Yet, there were so many characters which he had never heard of. More times than often, he would be forced to ask for Uzumaki Aisao's help since he didn't feel like he was making any progress. Upon hearing Minato's questions, Uzumaki Aisao understood that although Minato knew the basic concepts of sealing, he did not completely understand the art of using it. That was why Uzumaki Aisao had begun to teach Minato about Fuinjutsu from the start. His teachings were quite valuable for Minato who made notes and later added his own ideas into them as well. While teaching Minato, Aisao felt that Minato wasn't that attuned to Fuinjutsu as compared to an Uzumaki, but his talent in Fuinjutsu was far above the people who weren't Uzumaki. Moreover, his ideas were quite unique and were somewhat different from the standard. It felt like an outside-the-box thinking. Even though he had been teaching Minato, Aisao felt that his own understanding of Fuinjutsu was getting deeper by leaps and bounds. Minato's unique ideas reminded him a little of Araki's ideas. Although they were different from Minato's ideas, they were still unique in their own aspect. Araki's Uzumaki blood in him also helped him out in understanding seals rather quickly. However, after having studied till a certain level where, although he couldn't create strong seals, he could still understand the sealing to a certain extent. Maybe even use them when he needs to. Minato had been working extremely hard in advancing his sealing knowledge, while also studying the second Hokage's flying Raijin Jutsu. 
He understood that these unique characters which he couldn't understand were of second Hokage's own creation. He would probably need years to crack down the code and use it for himself. However, cracking down the code of second Hokage's flying Raijin Jutsu wasn't his aim. He simply wanted to take some inspiration from it, the rest, he was planning to create on his own. There were also a few things he understood, after utilizing the flying Raijin Jutsu, the second Hokage would probably need to pause for a certain time limit before he could use it again. Meaning, he couldn't use it in rapid succession. This was a point that Minato planned to introduce in his own Jutsu. Well, currently, he hadn't even scratched the surface though. He would need at least five or so years to finish with this seal. Meanwhile, Araki was talking with Jiraiya at this moment. Sensei plans to send nearly 100 or so elite shinobi to aim. However, within these 100 shinobi, a few of their young shinobi would be sent as well. It seems Sensei really wants to show his sincerity to Hanzo. I believe the Nara clan would be sending Shikaku. It would be a good chance to temper the child before the start of the third shinobi war. Jiraiya informed Araki about the current decision of the third Hokage. Araki had a faint smirk on his face upon hearing those words, I really want to warn Hanzo that he is making a mistake by allying with Konoha. Since, Hanzo has somehow forgotten the fact that Konoha didn't make a move in favor of its long-term ally. In fact, Konoha preferred to make sure their ally was destroyed. I really pity AIM. Jiraiya remained silent upon hearing this. Every time he remembered this action of his sensei and Danzo, he would be filled with disappointment. He just wished that if only he was there, maybe he could have convinced his sensei to send reinforcements. Don't worry, Jiraiya. I am well aware that the shinobi of Konoha isn't to be blamed about not assisting Yuzushio. It was mainly our dear, third Hokage, Danzo, and Orochimaru. Now that one of these three had been punished, I can maybe hold back my rage against the other two for some years. Jiraiya couldn't really say anything to Araki at this moment. He realized anything he said would fall upon deaf ears. He had heard from Araki that Orochimaru had experimented upon the dead bodies of the Uzumaki clan members, and Danzo had provided with the people to do that. It would have been stranger if Araki had restrained his rage and didn't take any action against them. A question did appear in his mind, and he decided to ask it right now, what do you plan with Orochimaru? Before Araki could answer, Jiraiya asked another question. Also, how do you plan to find Orochimaru? Even with my contacts, I have no idea where he has disappeared. It has been two weeks since anyone caught sight of his tracks. I can't really tell you about my plans regarding Orochimaru. But, as for that snake's location. I am naturally aware of his current location. Araki had a smile on his face before he added, that snake entered the land of lightning a week ago. He is currently residing in a village near Kumo. Jiraiya's eyes widened in shock, he didn't expect Araki to know this. Even though Jiraiya's spy network was spread in all parts of elemental nations, Orochimaru still managed to keep his trails hidden from them. Just how did Araki know of this? Just who was his spy that had managed to tail Orochimaru to this extent? The shocking look on Jiraiya's face was quite interesting. Araki chuckled a little before he started explaining, You see Jiraiya, nearly two months ago, I met Orochimaru where he confessed that he had indeed experimented on the dead bodies of the Uzumaki clan members which he had picked up from Yuzushio. Those words were pretty much a death sentence for himself. But because he has some use to me, I want to keep him alive for the next few years. Now, I naturally know the intelligence of that snake, and know he could be especially slippery and a troublesome person to deal with if he managed to escape. So, I plan to inject him with my chakra. With my sensing ability, as long as Orochimaru doesn't run off to another dimension, I would be able to sense him. Well, I was planning on injecting my chakra by shaking his hand or something, but that stupid snake attacked me and brought me into his mindscape. At that time, I injected my chakra into his mindscape. It stuck to his chakra so strongly that no matter what he does now or where he goes, he won't be able to sever it. And from what it looks like, Orochimaru still isn't aware of my chakra inside of his mindscape. As long as I want to, I can sense Orochimaru's location. He can never run away from me. Araki finished speaking with a decisive tone. This. Jiraiya was truly speechless upon hearing this. This was truly a great technique. 
Even someone as smart as Orochimaru wouldn't be able to deal with this technique. Well, there was something Araki didn't mention to Jiraiya. He couldn't use this technique on a lot of people. He had already injected his chakra into Kushina's mindscape so that he would always be aware of her position. She could require his assistance at any time. And the week soon passed away. The team of elite shinobi was sent to aim. Hanzo received a list of shinobi who were joining this team, and he was pleasantly surprised to know that even though these shinobi weren't too famous, he had at least heard of their names. Especially the two shinobi named Achiha Kashiro and Nara Shikaku. One was a prodigy of the frightening Achiha clan. At the same time, the other was a tactical genius, coming from the clan whose reputation was built upon their prowess of shadow and intelligence. Around this time, Minato met up with Araki and stated his desire, Clan Head, I want to go to AIM as well. Araki raised his brow in question and asked with a dark look on his face, Is it because you have received the order from the Hokage? Araki was naturally aware that Minato had received an order from the Hokage. Although Minato didn't understand the differences between Araki and the Hokage, he shook his head negatively before responding, That is one reason. But more importantly, many of my friends from the academy have been sent to aim. Although the Hokage didn't say anything, I am sure my friends would be fighting against IWA soldiers stationed at the borders. I don't want to remain here with the knowledge that my friends are out there fighting, or maybe dying. I want to go by their sides and protect them. This. Araki couldn't deny Minato's wishes. He couldn't help but smile when he heard the value of friendship in Minato's words. You know, you could die out there as well. You have just scratched the surface of the flying Raijin Jutsu. Araki said to Minato, trying to persuade him quite gently. To which, Minato replied, learning a Jutsu, even if that Jutsu was created by the second Hokage isn't worth it if I don't help my friends when I can. An interesting analogy, good for you that I think the same. Araki gave his agreement to Minato. Minato was relieved when he heard Araki's agreement. Araki continued speaking, however, you won't go there as someone under the Hokage. Huh? Minato was confused by what Araki meant. Then how would he leave Kanoha or even enter AIM? Araki clarified his words, from now on, Jiraiya's spy network, which covers the land of rain would be managed by you alone. You would be going to AIM to learn some things? That should be an acceptable excuse, right? Minato had a blank expression before he said to Araki, if I didn't know any better, I would have thought that you are trying to throw me out of the Senju clan manor. You can think of it like that. It would be a good idea to keep you away from that old man. And in AIM, you would be learning new things, while also protecting your friends. Well, other than the fact that you have massive pressure on your back, every other point has been covered, right? Araki said it quite casually. Now that I think of it, that would be a lot of tasks for myself, Minato said with a nervous laugh. All right, now go away. I don't want to see your face any longer. Araki shook his hands, ordering Minato to scram. After he left, Uzumaki Aisao soon entered his room. He first bowed in front of Araki and then said, Araki-sama, I received a letter from the Samazaki clan, they have mentioned that their storage seals have grown quite popular and they have amassed massive wealth. Heh. That's good. At this moment, Aisao curiously asked, Araki-sama, why did you allow them to create storage seals and sell them? Although it's a low-level seal, wouldn't it have been a difficult situation if someone realized that they were Uzumaki clan members? To this, Araki responded with a serious glint in his eyes, risk was naturally involved. But this was a risk I was willing to take. Aisao, do remember that I won't allow this level of risk to lead my life. I have been well prepared for the consequences. He rolled his eyes and continued, besides, even if we had remained very cautious, someone like Orochimaru would have still figured out the truth. Uzumaki Aisao agreed with the words of his clan head. Also, don't forget that you are all Uzumaki clan members. Soon, I would be raising the curtain for the Uzumaki clan. When the time comes, we must be ready. Araki said with some compelling power in his voice. Yes, Araki-sama. I understand now. He was about to turn ahead and leave when Araki suddenly called out for him, All right, I wanted to tell you something. You will be accompanying Minato to aim. Minato is going to aim? Why? This was news to Uzumaki Aisao. He didn't know of Minato's plans. 
He has his own reasons to go there. I want him to continue to study the flying Raijin Jutsu there. You will have to trouble yourself. Only Kushina and a few others can understand the flying Raijin Jutsu better than you. Besides, you are also quite familiar with Minato so it's natural I would choose you for this task. Araki gave his reasons. I don't need to fight, right? Isao asked Araki. Though he was quite proficient at seals, he wasn't that good at fighting. Araki shook his head, I would prefer it if you don't fight. Remain out of trouble, you are smart enough to do that. If you do want, I can send in some more Uzumaki clan members proficient in fighting to guard you. No. Isao casually denied for any guards, and soon continued, just give me a lot of money. Most of the issues in AIM would be solved by it. Araki agreed with his request and said to him, go to the treasury and take 10,000 Ryo. Isao was shocked by his words, Araki-sama. His shocked tone confused Araki as he wondered if what he gave was too little or not. He helplessly said to him, all right then, take 30,000 Ryo. I didn't think I was stingy earlier. He muttered the last line under his breath. Araki-sama, I meant that you shouldn't give me so much, Ryo. Aim is in economic instability. Even someone with 1,000 Ryo could be considered rich there. And you are giving me 30,000 Ryo? I feel like it will be my wealth which will attract trouble. Isao said with a sigh. To this, a smirk appeared on Araki as he said, the storage seal of Samazaki clan is of 10 Ryo. You can buy it and deal with those issues. With a storage seal, no one can know how much you have, right? He said quite jokingly. And well, Isao had black lines on his face. Spend money on a lowly storage seal? Never in his life. He soon left the room while Araki laughed out loud. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.